Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Board of Supervisors meeting from Mojave County. Uh, so please rise for the invocation from Pastor Ray Christensen. Good morning. Thank you um, for allowing us to come together in your name, O oh Lord. You surprise us each day, O oh Lord. The plant we thought that froze during the winter has sprung to life all of a sudden. And our friend that was in despair has been tempered with a bit of hope. So surprise us today in this meeting. In the midst of the scarcity that seems to dominate our days and years. Allow us to experience opportunities that can be seen through the lens of blessing. So grant these supervisors, our leaders and citizens, wisdom and insight to work for the communities that reside in our county and to build partnerships that can lead to enrich our life and to build bridges of consensus. And also, let us celebrate the blessings you give to us. Even in scarcity, we have been so blessed and sometimes we take it for granted. So we give you thanks that you allow us to live in a county and a country that gives us the freedom to live not in isolation, but in community as brothers and sisters in the midst of our diversity of values and priorities. May we always remember you are our God and we are your people. Amen. 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 Thank you, Thank Pastor you. Ray. You'll follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America, and, America and, to and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Need a motion for a executive session to be held May 20th at 9 a.m. for discussion and consultation with legal and counsel in accordance with the Arizona Revised Statutes 38-4303. Chair, uh, we entertain a motion. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion to carry. Just as a note, uh, the Board of Supervisors may, by motion, recess into an executive session to receive legal advice from the Board's attorneys on any item contained on this agenda, pursuant, pursuant to the Arizona Revised Statute uh, 38-341-03, <coughs> A, 3, and 4. Discussion or, I'm sorry, committee or legislative reports? Any activity? <laughs> yes, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, NACO hosted their first cybersecurity symposium in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, the conference went over the county's role in cybersecurity, how to better prepare for a cyber attack, and the importance of security in today's technological age. It was a day and a half conference uh, filled with a lot of speakers and panelists uh, regarding cybersecurity. Uh, Jerry Caddy, who is the director of cyber policy interrogation, uh, integration and Outreach National Security Staff with the Executive Office of the President spoke to the group on the threats that face our nation in regards to cybersecurity. Uh, with the advantages in technology today, cybersecurity is a threat every county faces. She gave some suggestions on what counties can do to become more aware of the threats cybersecurity could have on them. She suggested that local governments should develop a disaster plan in regards to cybersecurity just like they do in regards to flood control, tornadoes, and national disasters. She said the number one of Important thing for counties to do in regards to cybersecurity is to be aware. Also suggested we build the cost of protection and security into the cost of our networks and programs we invest in. Another growing theme was that you need to prioritize these costs, what is important and what needs protected. That is a question each county needs to answer for itself. For example, if we post our tax bills online for the public to see, protecting that information is not so much important as it is protecting the credit card information some would would use on our website to pay their tax bill. 
each second, 300 million megabytes of data is attacked through a denial of service attack. Uh, denials of service attacks are attacks in which an intruder makes it impossible for users to access their information. These attacks on county information can slow down constituents being able to access their information online, such as their tax bills, and it, would, it could slow down our internal network as well. Uh, during the conference, there were panels. Uh, information gathered from those panels was both informative and eye-opening, and for one, it was suggested that we should be using password phrases now instead of passwords. Example, instead of using Red Corvette 1967, one should use I have Red Corvette underscore it's at 1966. It may be long, but it's a difficult password to hack. You should not use the same password for everything. You should have different passwords for your personal info and for our work info. The password you use for social media account like Facebook should also be a completely different password. Another tip they mentioned was to always be aware <coughs> of where your email is coming from. Uh, one panelist mentioned that he tests his employees every so often by emailing them a suspicious email to see if they will click on the link. An intruder could get into an employee's email, email me, I open it, and just by clicking on the link and email thinking it was from a reliable source, that intruder now has access to our entire network. If an email looks suspicious, even if it's from someone you know, don't click on the links until you verify the person did indeed send it. Uh, Jeff Hein Reinhardt from the U.S. Secret Service spoke and gave examples of what counties uh, can do that doesn't cost much to ensure their networks. One would be to use management services for external facing vulner vulnerabilities, not internal ones. You need a third party set of eyes to see where your vulnerabilities are. You can run a basic internal network scan from companies like Nexus questions and check external paths where data can get in to or out of your system, USB storage, clouds, emails, disk, other things counties can do to enhance their security that doesn't cost much of anything at all. Change your password every 90 days, I believe we do that now, and do not write your password down on a sticky note and stick it to your desk. Dr. Gandhi suggested that you write it down in a diary that has a lock on it if you must. In regards to password, do not store them in an online password database. Do an annual IT security audit done by a third party. Don't use thumb drives and never use a thumb drive given to you that is free because it usually contains viruses. They gave some suggestions on what to, on how to follow up to create your cybersecurity policies. Uh, they suggested looking at NIST SP 800-51. It's a publication released by the National Institute of Standards and Technology in regards to security and privacy controls for federal information systems and organizations. They also su suggest visiting the uh, www.coursera.com for free training classes on cybersecurity. Uh, the Rural Public Lands County Council that I sit on had a meeting this month in which we discussed the secure rural schools funding, fracking and the economy in the Ninth Circuit ruling on Pacific Northwest Agreement on Forest Management. Uh, the Obama administration is trying to make states who receive <coughs> uh, secure rural schools Title I and III funding in 2012 and 2013 pay it back or have the money taken out of the Title II funds not yet allocated for this year. Many states have already adopted <clears throat> the money they received into their spending, and in most cases, the money has been spent. Being forced to pay this back will cause a major constraint on states that could trickle down to the county level. Um, Governor Sean Parnell from the state of Alaska wrote a letter to the United States Forest Service giving notice that he will not be returning the SRS payments. The Western Governors Association, on behalf of all Western governors, also sent a letter um, to the president. Through this. We're getting a little. Also, had the uh, cloud computing. <clears throat> Governor Defenders, an organization put together to provide government professionals with cybersecurity resources and concepts, hosted a cybersecurity online event this month which focused on cloud computing. And cloud computing has come a long way from when it first started and arrived on the scene two years ago. The thought of government entities going to the cloud would not have been enforce forcible, but in today's world, government organizations are starting to implement cloud technology. John Nicholson, a strategic negotiator from Infosystems, spoke to us about cloud computing or just how far it has come in just over two years. In 2010, the United States spent $40 billion on cloud computing. Today, we spend over $142 billion, and, it, and it's estimated we'll spend $241 billion in 2021. Now, there are two different types of different clouds, the public cloud and the private. Microsoft distinguishes between public and private clouds based on whether the IT resources are shared between many distinct organizations, public cloud, or dedicated to the single government private cloud. 
Most government agencies look into public clouds because they're the most cost effective. With public cloud comes the question and concern of security. The event gave an excellent presentation done by an IT consultant about the new service called FedRAMP that is designed to help government organizations transition <coughs> to the cloud. <coughs> FedRAMP is a government-wide program that provides a standardized approach to security assessment, authorization, and continuous monitoring for crowd, cloud products and services. This approach is meant to be done once, used many times, framework that will save cost, time, staff requirements to conduct redundant agency security services. Uh, also, the Heartland Institute put together a conference call last week regarding Common Core. I won't go over the benefits or the distractions of Common Core, but uh, Joy Pullman was the speaker who spoke regarding the financial concerns that Common Core will have on our stage. And she mentioned an independent study done by the Pioneer Institute that estimated the cost over a seven year period to implement Common Core nationwide would be between 12 and $16 trillion. The Arizona School Boards Association and Arizona Association of School Business Officials conducted a survey of the cost just for our state. Uh, they estimate the total startup cost to get the program going at $381 million. It will cost about $156 million for new textbooks, training and assessments. Additional costs related to technology, including administration uh, of the uh, new assessment, a national, nationwide test that will create a standard set of K-12 assessments in math and English, <clears throat> would be about $225 million. When the test is implemented in 2014, it will be an internet computer only test resulting in schools that have not done so already to invest in new technology by 2014 in order to administer the test. And, and I just bring that up because anything that affects the state will obviously trickle down to us and could affect ours. That's all I add, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you for your report, Supervisor <coughs> Johnson. Uh, could you explain br briefly your role on the national uh, scene? Are you the, the chairman of the committee? Vice chair. Vice chair. One of the vice chairs of the Cybersecurity Task Force. So. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your service on that committee. Uh, number three, County Administrator's Report. Mr. Hendricks. I have no report today, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hendricks. From there, we'll go to the call of the public. <clears throat> Those wishing to address the board, the call of the public regarding matters not on the board of agenda, must fill out and submit to the clerk a call to the public, which is the yellow form. Request to speak form located at the back of the room prior to the meeting. Action taken as a result of public comments will be limited to responding to criticism, referral to staff, or placing a matter on a future agenda. Comments are restricted to items not on the regular agenda, with the exception of the consent agenda, and must relate to matters within the realm of the jurisdiction of this board. I have one person for the call of the public. Mr. Steve Robinson. Please state your name and address for the record. I'm Stephen Robinson, 3439 North Bowie Road in Golden Valley, Arizona. Chairman Watson, supervisors, I submitted, and you may have in front of you, a copy of this little essay I prepared. And attached is a <clears throat> chart showing all the reimbursements from the special taxing districts. And I'm going to just speak briefly on that subject and then switch to a second subject. Over the past two months, the board has approved two different funding formulas based upon the same single law. In March, you passed this per parcel charge, which is about 147 a share or per parcel for all the countywide districts. Then in April, you passed a, re a schedule of reimbursements based upon for the fire districts, which requires them, if they use the attorney, assessors, treasurers, or other offices within the county or election services, to pay a, f a fee. You had revised the schedule that was initially set up in 2008. And what I want to say about that is, how can you use a schedule that's mandatory to charge the special taxing districts this per parcel charge when it's an optional to charge the districts for that. Yet when you have the fire districts where you're required to charge them for services, 
you don't charge them for the same services that you charge the other special taxing districts. So I think you should look at that, and it's a subject that's been on my mind for over a year because I wrote about it in January or in April of 2012. The second subject I wanted to talk about is I noticed in, April, or in March that the county paid off the administration building with almost $10 million of funds. Now, I believe in paying off debt. It's a good and prudent thing. But when you use unrestricted funds, funds from the general fund department or from debt service funds that's already allocated, that is well and good, except when you have the funds that were set up through the sales tax. As, and the sales tax money, that quarter cent sales tax, is designated only for capital improvements. So you, so you took funds out of a unrestricted account from other sources, the general funds, to pay off a building when, in fact, there's another five and a half plus million dollars a year going into a restricted account that originally was designated to pay off those, the, the building lease, the land lease, you know, the lease purchase option. And if we're in such good financial shape that we can use unrestricted money to pay off buildings, then I'm sure there's a, more than one county employee that's going to say, okay, where's our raises if you have that much money? So I think you should take a look. And right now there's another $7.5 million in the jail debt service fund. Six million of it came from the TV district. And I just believe that there's better uses for that money when we have a restricted account to pay off that building. Thank you very much. Any Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Next item on our agenda is a proclamation declaring May Mental Health <coughs> Awareness Month. Uh, would those folks that are here for the Mental Awareness Month please step up to the, to the podium? Good morning. I'll read the proclamation and then we can all join you for a little snapshot. How's that? Proclamation, whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being, and whereas all Americans experience times of difficulty and stress in their lives, and whereas promotion and prevention are effective ways to reduce the burden of mental health conditions, and whereas there is a strong body of research that report user-friendly tools that all Americans can access to better handle challenges and protect their health and well-being, and whereas Mental health conditions are real and prevalent in our nation. And whereas, with efficient treatment, those individuals with mental health conditions can recover and lead full, productive lives. And whereas, each business, school, government agency, faith-based organization, health care provider, and citizen has a responsibility to promote mental health awareness and support prevention efforts. Now, there it be resolved that Mojave County Board of Supervisors does hereby proclaim May 2013 as Mental Health Month Pathways to Wellness and calls upon the citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses and schools of Mojave County to recommit our community increasing awareness and understanding of our mental health. The steps of our citizens can take to protect the mental health and the need for appropriate and accessible services for all people with mental health conditions. Executed this sixth day of May, 2013. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go, <coughs> if we can all go up and we'll get our picture taken with the folks.
to you. I would just like to take a minute to thank all of you. A uh, special um, thank you to Hilde Angus for making sure that this happened, but we appreciate all of you. Um, we spend all year working on mental health and bringing you know, awareness and helping people, but um, we appreciate you offering the opportunity for us to make May an awareness month because we all know someone that has mental health issues, everything from you know, mild anxiety and depression, which any of us can suffer from, to people with serious mental illness that um, we just would like to make sure that the stigma of mental health decreases each year, so we just continue after it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. All right, we have a presentation from the uh, Moss Mine Reactivation Project. That'd be the Golden Vortex Group. Good morning. Morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, my name is Dick Whittington. I'm CEO of Northern Vertex, more well known in these parts as Golden Vertex, and I have my team here, uh, Joe Bodswich, Brian Munson, and John Masterson. They're the guys that keep me out of trouble. Uh, and we're looking at reactivating the old moss mine uh, near Bullhead City. Uh, first of all, uh, I will say that I'm Canadian. Uh, I'd like to reassure you I'm not a snowbird, so I'm not sort of flying in and flying out. Uh, we're looking to be permanent residents, or at least my company is of your county. Uh, we feel a very privileged to be here, and we're looking forward to creating what we call some of the words that I heard in, in the invocation a little earlier today, which uh, opened this session uh, in terms of building partnerships, of consensus, uh, bridges, and so forth. This is exactly what we stand for at Golden Vertex. And uh, in terms of what's happening on the site, uh, just very briefly, uh, we do have uh, some construction people on site right now. They are moving the project forward. Uh, we are doing this in a very constructive and what I call consultative process with people in the community. Uh, we have formed a advisory council. Lisa McCabe has very graciously offered to chair that council at which we do invite uh, input from members of the community, stakeholders, and that will be meeting actually right after this meeting, and that's a process we'll be continuing with. In terms of the mine itself, it's going to be done in two stages. Uh, the first stage is what we call a pilot plant. Uh, it's where we're looking at an experimental pit. We're doing what we call pilot plant technology, and making sure essentially that the process works as we expect it to work, but also that it works and it meets all the required standards of uh, managerial as well as environmental and reporting controls. Uh, once that's done, we'll be moving forward with uh, what we think will be a significant investment in the community, somewhere in the range of $30 million to open up the mine itself. And we'll be looking at creating somewhere in the range of 200 jobs uh, in and around the Bullhead City area. Uh, we do have a very strong commitment, and I think uh, these guys are holding me to it, and I'm happy to be held to it in terms of buying locally, supporting locally, and uh, making sure that we do give people in the community and adjacent to the mine, if you like, a first right of refusal of any of the jobs and works at the site, again, as long as they meet all the safety and necessary technical qualifications, but this is a very strong belief of myself, and if any of you hear of any situations where it's not being heard from or we're not adhering to it, uh, feel free to give me a call and uh, register your complaints and we'll get on it straight away. Uh, as I said, we're privileged to be in your community. I look forward to being a constructive neighbor and citizen of your community. And again, thank you very much for asking me to make this presentation today. Yeah, thank if you, you have so any much. questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes. Say something. <laughs> Even though it is called the Moss Mine, I have claimed that mine in my district, and I will confer that um, Golden Vortex has been a wonderful um, member of the community thus far. Um, taking into consideration the county, the city, and the Indian tribes into the process. 
or the process, as you say in Canada. And um, I, I, I could I could translate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I want to I want to thank you uh, for for coming here and for sticking to that. I know it's been a longer process. How long have you been in this area before we even heard about you guys? Oh, I think probably about eighteen months, Joe. You'd say that just. Uh, you know, basically doing our due diligence work and starting to move the project forward. And now we're starting to, uh, say, put up equipment on site, starting to hire people. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, the moss is starting to grow, if you like. So, <laughs> well, I've taken a tour of that mine with you. And anyone, if you can do that, I would suggest you do it. It is awesome. It is very interesting. Um, they are really. Um, have invested a lot of money thus far, and we expect really great returns from that mine. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, you're certainly all invited. Supervisor Moss. Um, I would just like to state for the record, I do not accept um, Supervisor Angus's claim of ownership. <laughs> we will be contesting it. <laughs> Supervisor Bretherton. Yes. I know Hildy has claimed it, and Steve Moss has claimed it, but it's in Mojave County, so it belongs to all of us. Uh, right. Exactly. Right. We're happy with that. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. All right, now we'll go down to the consent agenda. Okay. Items to be pulled from the consent agenda. Chairman Watson. Uh, like to pull items 22, 35, 46, and 63. Okay, Supervisor Johnson. Um, I, I will just mention the same one she did in case, <clears throat> so I don't miss the ones I want. 22, 35, 37, 41, 42, 46, 63, 76. Okay, I've got. 22, 35, 37, 41, 42, 46, and I missed one. 63 and 76. It was 63 you wanted, wasn't it? 63 and 76. Range. Okay. Supervisor Brotherton? No, I don't have anything. Supervisor Ma? Um, I'd like to pull items 8. 8. Fifty through sixty one and sixty four through sixty nine and, and sixty four through sixty nine uh, and sixty four through sixty nine correct thank you okay we'll double check it again I have eight twenty two thirty five thirty seven 41, 42, 46, 50 through 61, 63, 64 through 69, and 76. Is that correct? <coughs> okay, thank you. Chair would entertain a motion for those items. Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion to approve the consent minus items 8, 22, 35, 37, 41, 42, 46, items 50 through 61, 63 through 69, and item 76. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions? Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those aye. opposed? Motion is carried. There we'll go to item number 8. If I could, Mr. Chairman, um, the reason I pulled this was a little bit of paranoia based upon my recent airport experiences. We have a motion for discussion. Oh, sorry. Um, I move to discuss item A to the agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Those in favor say five say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted a clarification from um, Mr. Ekstrom or Mr. Hendricks on page three of the resolution. Um, the resolution is essentially that now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors at their regular meeting on Monday, May 6, 2013 approve this zoning use permit as recommended by the Mojave County Planning and Zoning Commissions and outlined herein. And that's very similar to the airport language which caused which from 20 plus years ago which caused problems. 
and I wanted to find out if the language might be better improved by saying as recommended by, subject to, and conditioned upon compliance with the Mojave County Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendations outlined herein. Mr. Hendrick, or Mr. Ekstra. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Moss, we have no objection to that. Okay. And, and what it comes down to is, a couple decades ago, there was some conditions the Mojave County Board Planning and Zoning had recommended. Whether it was clear they were incorporated into the board's motion or not was that issue, which caused a lot of subsequent problems, and I wanted to avoid it on this issue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I move that we approve item, item 8 of the agenda, um, subject to, um, and rec as recommended by, and conditioned upon compliance with all conditions of the Mojave County Planning and Zoning Commission outlined within resolution number 2013-050. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Item number 22. Motion to discuss. Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Um, Chairman Watson, I'd like to table item 22 to our June, with our first meeting in June. Okay. That would be June, June the 3rd, is that correct? Okay. I'll second your motion. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carried. Item number 35. Motion to discuss. Second. We have a motion and a second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Um, Chairman Watson, when I first came on board here, I started getting several phone calls about some issues that were taking place at the animal shelter. And not knowing much about it, I had my assistant, Kelly Boff, do a pretty in-depth report on the shelter, how it's run, um, some of the suggestions to make it better, some of the issues that uh, have come up. And uh, unfortunately, um, I sort of fell, um, I, let, I let it fall between the cracks. I didn't send it on to the other supervisors. I didn't realize it was, the, the contract was going to be put into this agenda. And um, I'd like, before we, we, uh, we approve this contract for renewal, I would just li uh, like the other supervisors to have the opportunity to see what these issues are before we vote on it, just two weeks for our next meeting in May. So if um, you can indulge me that. And that would be May, May 3rd, is that correct? Right. May 3rd, 10th? Right. Sure. The May, well, May, May 20th? May 20th. May 20th, okay. So my motion is to table this item until our May 20th meeting. Second. I have a motion and a second to table this till May 20th. Further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Item will be tabled until May 20th. May 20th. Item number 37. Motion for discussion. Second. I have a motion and a second. Mr. Chairman, I brought this up more for um, to inform the other board members in case anybody wants to uh, take another look. If you look at all of our projects that the county has coming forward, <laughs> we have a tremendous um, contingency fund balance in each one of these. Uh, that's only been something that was been put into effect, I don't know, not that many years ago, less than 10 years ago. I kind of feel that if somebody gives us a bid, they should come in underneath that bid. Um, one of the reasons that the county has come in under every bid that's ever gone out in the last, say, 10 years is because of the contingency fund. So even if they overspend the money, it's already covered. Uh, I believe that every override should come back to the Board of Supervisors, uh, whether it's something that's, you know, if it's good for us or if there's a problem with the contractor, I, I believe we need to have knowledge of it. But basically it has nothing to do with this item, but that's way, my way to get it in. So I would make a motion to approve item 37. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Um, I have a, a question just Supervisor to be clear. Supervisor Moss. 
is the motion to bring all contingencies back to the board, um, Supervisor Johnson? I, I well, missed that. Well, the, the, it was just to basically educate the rest of the board that, that this was in there, something you might not you know, be aware of. Um, we used to have it that way where they all came back uh, to the board for every time we had an override, uh, but it was a feeling of the of previous boards that that wasn't necessary, so I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention in case anybody else wanted to, felt the same way. And that's item or subcategory number six, the 10% contingency? Yes, sir. Okay. But as I understand, as it stands right now, we're not changing the contract. We're just going to put it on the horizon so we might want to take action on other construction projects in the future? Right, in okay. case it was in case people yeah. decided that's something you might look at. Okay, any further discussion or questions? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Item number 41. Motion for discussion. Motion for, and I'll second, motion and a second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Uh, Supervisor Johnson. I had a question as to how we're getting over our uh, budgeted amount here, and I want to answer that. This is the approval of a transfer of $44,000. Uh, and 21500 from the general fund, uh, respected to cover ongoing juror and court reporter transcript costs. And who would you like to address your question to? I guess whoever can answer why we're, why we're over budget. Good morning, Chairman Watson, Good morning. Vice Chair Angus, board members, may it please the board. Uh, the reason is quite simple. Last year we had 36 jury trials. This year we have already had 56, and we have numerous jury trials scheduled through the end of the year. The budget was based upon prior year's experience, and we have had a spike in jury trials, and the court certainly has no ability to you know, turn around and tell a litigant that you're not going to have a jury trial in a criminal civil matter if they so request it. And there's no funds anywhere else that can be moved in to cover that? No. In fact, we have, the court has uh, applied to the state and has received reimbursement for some monies on jury trials. Uh, as I recall, it was approximately 10000 We've been reimbursed thus far $10,516. We currently have uh, pending with the state on the uh, lengthy jury trial funds another $13,000. The point I would make is that you know, upon receipt of this $23,000, it does not go back into the jury fund. It goes to the general fund. And so even though we get reimbursed by the state, and we only get reimbursed for the lengthy jury trials. In other words, if we have a jury trial of five days or less, the state does not reimburse us. We, are, we can only apply for those that qualify, and we have applied for all of the jury trials that have exceeded the time frame. The other issue that has um, obviously impacted is that th this last year with the Ketchner trial, we had a capital case. We have not had a capital case in a number of years. That jury expense alone was $33,308. And so given the nature of the capital case and the tremendous amount of increase in jury trials, that is what has pushed the need for the additional funds. And obviously, this is a mandated service. That's the only question that I had. Just one more. Thank you, Supervisor Johnson. And thank you for answering the question that I had on the Kessner trial. It's my understanding that there's a huge cost in the continuing capital, especially when you're seeking the, the death penalty. Is that correct? And I would note that that trial actually uh, was able to finish two to three weeks Earlier, ahead of no. schedule, or we would have been looking at a much greater sum. Thank you very much, Judge Goodler. Mr. Anderson? There's no further questions. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, and motion carried. Item number 42. Motion for discussion. Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? 
Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not sure this is a public works issue. I'm not sure why this is on the agenda. The, the signage down there, we're going through the renovation of uh, the court building in Lake Havasu. Uh, the signs have been up for 16 years. Uh, there's no reports of any problems. Uh, I had had Lake Havasu Police Department pull the reports of any vandalism or anything in, in vehicles. There is none. Um, I've seen the new design plans that have come in, and I believe that uh, Public Works and the manager are working on um, parking issues down there. So I don't see whether there's any. I just moved to um, take no action on this item at the time until we get a new building built. If Supervisor, Supervisor Moss. Yeah. Um, I recall reading correspondence and various memorandums where a, there was one very credible threat against a judge's life on the Lake Havasu complex and one not so credible threat and various acts of vandalism towards employee cars because the bad guys know who the employees' cars are because there's a sign saying employee parking only and they can go out there and lurk and wait for the judge or key the car. And the purpose of taking these signs down was to avoid our judicial employees and our judges from becoming sitting ducks to bad guys. Um, uh, I, th I thought from the documents I read, it was a very commonsensical move. That was, that was my understanding also. The reason this started out, when, when we put the building in, or when we put everything together, uh, my original idea was to block off and have keyed parking for employees. The employees did not want that. Uh, so we tried to get where we had uh, employee areas so that employees parked in one area, uh, people who were doing business were able to park in front so they could actually get, get up to the front for service easier. That way we could control, uh, if you saw somebody who didn't belong in the employee parking, you could say, hey, somebody's out there doing something. The judges never, they do not park in the, let's put it this way, they, they're not assigned a place in the employee parking. So the judges are out of it as far as that goes. Um, there has been no malicious mischief in all these years. Um, it's not going to make any difference if they think the public cannot figure out who the judges are or who the uh, employees are and where they park. If they're parking in between, then anybody can be standing by the car. But if, if they have a, a certain location um, where the employees park and you see somebody who doesn't belong, then you notify security and somebody can go out there and take a look. There's no reason for anybody else to be in the employee parking. Uh, the problem came from the courts just took down the signs uh, without going through uh, the, the public works. We just had big old spots on the walls. The only reason it was brought to my attention to begin with, but um, there are no complaints. There are no filings with the police department of any ma malicious mischief or vandalism to cars when they look back at them. Um, if, Thank Mr. you, Supervisor Johnson. Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Anger. Um, have, have the employees um, voiced any opinion as to do they care? Do they want the parking? Do they not want the parking? The employees you talk to? It's, not an, it's never been an issue until, until this came up. Okay. I was going to suggest that I saw um, Judge Gertler getting ready to stand. Yes, I just saw him. <laughs> Come to the floor. Judge Gertler. If I could address that particular issue. Uh, what had happened is there was the credible threat against a judge that led to an arrest. We then had a second threat against the judge and the clerks. It was after the threat to the clerk's office as well that we had the keying of an employee vehicle. That employee did not submit a police report and I would probably suggest to the board that that's not uncommon. If you go to Walmart and you find that your car door has been dented because someone turned around and opened their door, you're probably not going to call the police and report that either. Or you go to, you know, the Target and someone keyed your vehicle, you may or may not call the police. In our investigation, uh, we found that that employee has left the county's employee or maybe the city's employee because it was a clerk at the consolidated court. We also then found that there was, during this time frame, a second act of malicious mischief. 
and that was that uh, an individual had a vehicle that was towed presumably behind a trailer and someone had ripped out the um, electrical that would allow the lights you know from the main vehicle to you know access that vehicle so that people could see that they're turning or stopping the reason the signs came down and i was not involved in the initial signs coming down and i do apologize that the court did not inform supervisor johnson that the signs were coming down is that as a result of these acts of vandalism the employees the court employees who primarily used this area complained to judges davis and judges bartlett they then met with or consulted with our court security bob lawless which I would note that as a result of the initial threat, they, uh, security had advised the employees, use a different vehicle if you can, take a different route to the court, and security determined it was an issue. And so as a result of that, security then put in the request to Public Works to remove the signs. The signs, when removed, left the non-painted portion of the wall there but that's an easy fix. They say that they have paint left over from when they painted the wall, and I would suggest to you that once the construction is through, we're probably going to have to paint that wall in any event. I did meet along with Court Administrator Kip Anderson, with Supervisor Johnson's Administrative Assistant, Sue Donahue. At that meeting, she suggested Supervisor Johnson wanted to um, you know, create an employee parking only area. We fully support that type of concept. And, and to be frank with you, uh, under the Constitution, as well as uh, interpretations of that, the presiding judge has the ability to administer the court facilities, including the parking. And, and I would have you note th that I have not taken that step to address an, through an administrative order the removal of the signs. I thought it was better. In fact, I did not even reference that at the meeting with Ms. Donahue. I thought it was better to work with Supervisor Johnson's office, and I think that conceptually we have some good ideas as to how we can accomplish this. That certainly is going to take some time with public works. I did not want to issue the administrative order. I felt it was better to have cooperation with the board, and that is why I brought the issue before the board. Thank you, Judge Gerler. Any questions? Yeah, I have a... Supervisor Moss? It seems to me that until such time as we're willing to invest the money to have a secure employee parking area with keyless entries and what I've, what not I've heard before, that um, if security and common sense dictates that you don't make our employees a sitting duck and, and in cooperation with the judiciary, we perhaps should have those employee parking signs come down. If I may also address, uh, Supervisor Johnson indicated that the judges do not park there. That is correct in that Judges Bartlett and Davis do not park in that area where the employee-only parking signs were located. However, when I had my rotation in Lake Havasu City, that's where I parked. Judge Weiss, up until uh, the appointment of Judge Lambert, when he comes, he parked in that area. Judge Lambert, now coming to Lake Havasu City to handle his Lake Havasu case assignment, parks in that area. When we have had La Paz County judges come up as visiting judges, they park in that area. So in general, Supervisor Johnson is correct that the, the primary judges in Lake Havasu City have not parked there. It is not true to say that the judges do not park in that area because we have been doing so for years and will continue to do so. Thank, Thank you, you, Judge Goodwin. I've got, I got a little more on that than that go that easy. Um, <laughs> There, there is space available for visiting judges to park if, if somebody has a problem. Um, I, I believe that most of the employees there, we have a contract with, with Lake Havasu City to uh, furnish us with clerks to handle uh, the courtroom down there. Have we had any complaints from the city of Lake Havasu regarding security? I guess I'd ask the county manager that first. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Johnson, I'm, I'm truly not aware of uh, any complaints. The only thing I'm aware of is uh, the letter that uh, uh, the judge has provided to the Board of Supervisors regarding his request. So I guess that's, that, that's all I have. We can sit and argue over a parking space forever, but. Thank you. 
I move to approve item 42 of the agenda, the removal of the employee-only parking signs that are or were located on the east wall of the parking lot in Lake, the Lake Havasu City facility. I have a motion, <coughs> and I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nope. Motion carried. Item number 46. Uh, I believe I, I pull this off, Mr. Chairman. Motion for discussion. Motion for discussion. Second. Second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Item number 46. Chairman, if I may, um, if somebody can explain why Judge um, the previous Bullhead City Justice of the Peace, why this was put together. I realize every time we have a, have a census we can do this. Um, who's going to take credit for this report or why we're doing it? Mr. Temper. <laughs> Mr. Temper, I guess my question, Mr. Temper, is with the Elections Department. Okay. I, I can see reviewing things because population or judicial credits because we've added new courts because of judicial credits. I see neither of those here. We're not adjusting for nobody had too much population because it's mostly judicial credits. So why are we changing something that's worked for quite a few years? Well, my understanding is the justice of the pieces don't feel that it worked all that well. And these lines can be changed at any time, any time down the line, but the most Realistic time is when they have a census come out, like when we did the Board of Supervisors and the Community College and the, the Joint Technological Education Districts, because we have the fresh numbers to do so. Now, those other districts I just mentioned are very important on population, because it's representation. One person, one, you know, one vote. So when we spread them out for all you guys and stuff like that, we made it pretty, pretty darn close. But if you look at it, it's not logical for the Justice of the Peace to be that way, because if so, just think of a scenario. We have five of them right now, and that's like right into the boundaries of uh, there's something like 2,000 uh, judicial credit something or another's that are used as like saying that's a maximum to use. Now, they have worked in the past, but the, an issue is this. The Lake Havasu Court has a lot lower judicial productivity credits, that's the terminology, than, say, Bullhead City. Bullhead was at the top, and the former judge was Judge Brady from Bullhead City. Judge Brady brought this plan up knowing that we could indeed, which we did 10 years ago, redistrict the JP districts, and he brought this to the other, the other JPs as well and saying this could be a direction we could go, and it actually makes perfect sense. The biggest part of it is this. There are less credits down in Lake Havasu there were too many in Bullhead City to make an equitable caseload, so to speak, you know, when it could be resolved by moving three voting precincts worth of people. Call it population or just call it people in general because the more people you have, the more problems are going to happen, right? So things are going to happen and they're going to have to hear it in court. So if we were to move the Oatman, the Yucca, and the Topak voting precincts, two of them from the Bullhead City area, and the, uh, and the yucca from the Kingman area down to the Bullhead, uh, down to the Lake Havasu, it'll make population closer, which would mean make sense that judi judicial predictivity credits will come closer in sync with each other. And a big problem was this. Where they were cut up before, there's a 40, approximately a 40 mile stretch of Interstate 40 from the river to about Griffith Energy, uh, the plant. Now that stretch was, is, being administered by three JP districts. But they're not always being sent to the right place when the police write the tickets. That is a huge issue. Judge Brady's main goal was to balance out the ju judicial predictivity credits a little bit so he wasn't overwhelmed, even though he's not here, you know, and move it a little more equitable, which makes sense to me at least. And second of all, to try to get the court, one court, 
to handle all these, like, you know, if you have 10 mile stretch here and a 20 mile stretch here, so the police can actually write the tickets into the right place and go to the people and go to the right place and do what they have to do for like, tra mainly traffic tickets, you know, is what, I, what my understanding was. And the rest of the part is in Kingman, which it was before. So that's my understanding why the move wanted to be done. I think it's very logical for what was attempted, you know, what was asked to go out and, and do. Um, I did input it two years ago, the Board of Supervisors agreed to look at and to do a redistricting of the JP districts, you know, if it was the right thing to do. And I just didn't do that process. I didn't do the process. I don't do the process. I'm the facilitator. We're having a, that consulting company, we still had a little bit still hanging off for them to do so to do this project, and they picked it up in 2012, and it's slowly taking shape, and quite honestly, it's there. It's that close to being there, and the big thing is if you all approve it and think it's a good idea, the big thing is getting to the Department of Justice, which they've been working on for months, and I've been working back and forth because those people are just something else. That's all I gotta say, okay? <laughs> So basically speaking, to answer your question the best I can, Supervisor Johnson, it did work, but this definitely would be a better fix for the two areas that was brought up in conversation. All right, now my question is, was the Bullhead judicial credits, was it to the point where we had to form another court? It was not. Okay, then my, in my opinion, all this breaks down to is you have, whatever, five, how many how many JPs do we have? Five. Five. Four of them are set at a higher rate. By doing this, all five will now receive the same higher rate of pay. My right. understanding is the rate of pay, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, please. You probably know this answer. I thought they were all being paid the same except the North Canyon, which is a lot lower. There's two or three tiers in payment for the JPs, which I came across somewhere. And I believe right now they're all being paid the same. They're all being paid at the same rate. I don't know, I thought, I thought Lake Havasu was lower because we didn't have the judicial credits. Lake Havasu is very near it, but there's been a lot of people going down, they've been hearing cases, and that's been bringing their JPC credits up. Right, but this, this will even out the credits so that Havasu will have a higher salary. It will, project. it'll make it more equitable playing field for all the JPs and the constables. They, they follow right along with them, so. I, I don't know that the constables will have, I mean, I'm not going to speak for them, but they have a, a district, and they actually have to leave their office, unlike the judges who can sit on their, in their courtroom every day. The, the constables have to go out and do work. Uh, this is going to put a whole new uh, situation on them, especially with, regarding uh, their mileage, because now you have people who are going to uh, have to go quite a, quite a distance. So I think that's come up in our budget time also, not this year, but the year from now. Gotcha. That's all I had. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Supervisor Angus, I know you brought it up too. We all right? All right. Any other questions? I have none, Mr. Temper. Do you have any questions, further? Uh, Supervisor Bresden or Supervisor Moss? No. Thank you. And I didn't actually address you all, but thank you for calling me up. I started talking to Supervisor Johnson the first we came up, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Temper. I'll make a motion to adopt. Uh, the 2015 Mojave County Justice Precincts per the ARS 22-101. Uh, second. We have a motion and second. Further discussion? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We have a speaker to that item. Ms. Peggy Gilman. Ms. Gilman, if you'll please give your name and address for the record. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Supervisors, my name is Peggy Gilman. I reside at 1763 Lippin Circle in Fort Mojave. And uh, I'm here to speak in opposition to this item. I'm employed as a manager at Mojave Electric Cooperative, and as such, I am here today representing the management of the cooperative, the board of directors, and our roughly 35,000 members of the cooperative. Uh, our concern is with the realignment of the Topak area, and um, which would remove it from the Bullhead City um, 
Justice of the Peace area into the Lake Havasu area, as you've discussed. And the issue that we have is regarding the um, court activities on cases dealing with theft of power and metals theft, in particular the, the theft of copper. Um, this, of course, is important to um, all of us, and in particular uh, to the cooperative, because it is member-owned and um, the expenses in those kinds of activities um, are passed on to the other members. So we feel that this is an important concern. Um, specifically, the problem is that it would split the, mem the uh, service territory of the cooperative into two different um, jurisdictions. And um, we have s some feeling, based on previous conversations, that those offenses would be handled differently if it was heard in Bullhead City as it being a heard in Lake Havasu. And this is based on a, a conversation that our board of directors, President Lynn Opaka, had with representatives from the um, Justice of the Peace District office in Lake Havasu. Um, their understanding was that it's a, a cooperative and member-owned, so the members can do whatever they want and steal power and steal, steal copper, um, which we don't think is a reasonable conclusion in the court. So I thank you for listening, and I understand that this is you know, a process and a difficult thing that you're trying to make the best work, but uh, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gilman. Hey, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question of Ms. Gilman? Yes, Ms. <clears throat> Ms. Gilman, we have a question for Supervisor Moss. By the way, I'm a big fan of her son, Scott. So. <laughs> I'll but, let him know. Thank you, thank you. Supervisor um, Moss. The, um, uh, who told you that it was okay for co-op members to steal power? I don't have a name. Um, it was the comment was given to me from Lynn Opaka, but I, I don't have a name. But I would be happy to follow up with you on that. Please, thank you. Any further questions of Ms. Gill? Thank, thank you, you Ms. Gill. Um, if I could make a statement before the vote, um, Supervisor Mott. Yeah. I understand the cooperative's concerns um, regarding having to go to two different jurisdictions. Um, and I especially understand their concerns if they have the understanding that certain employees think it's okay for co-op members to steal power, which I think is wrong, um, a illegally incorrect supposition. Um, however, I think when it comes to balancing out the workloads of the justice of the peace, we have to look things more as an administrative standpoint as opposed to which court um, people show up in order to um, deal with their citation. And having traveled between um, Bullet City and Lake Havasu Court and back in Yucca and all those others, the distance is more or less the same. So I don't think they've lost time um, for people who are located and residing in the Topak Yucca area. Um, Yucca actually improves, I think, if they get sent to Lake Havasu. Um, but anyways, um, so if we, it, there's already a, mo a pending motion, so I don't think we need to restate it. I'm, I didn't catch your last sentence. I'm sorry. Um, it, do we need to restate the motion, or is, is yes, it already pending? Yes, please restate the motion. I move that we approve item 46 of the agenda. And I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. Motion carries. <coughs> Item 50. Motion to discuss. Second. If I could. Motion and a second for discussion. Second. Those um, in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right. Thank okay. you. I believe I pulled um, items 50 through 61 and 64 through 69, not because I'm opposed, but because I had questions. And I thought the public, some persons in the public may have questions. And the first question, and so I'd like to address all of them at once to save sure. time, if I may. All right. Um, when it comes to this for 50 through 61 and 64 through 69, I didn't see that any t sort of traffic studies had been done in order to count the numbers of vehicles traveling those roads. Did I miss it? 
because I see Ms. Supervisor Brotherton nodding her head saying there were traffic studies. <laughs> well, I didn't see it. Uh, would you like our <coughs> Mr. Hendricks? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Moss, uh, there may be some traffic studies done on one or two of these roadways, but uh, our general procedure for uh, this process is that people would petition the county to take a look at their roads and actually the statutes require that these roads be brought up to county standards at no cost to the county. So what we do as staff is we go out and meet with the individuals and show them actually what needs to be done and try to come up with an estimated, give them an estimated fill for cost to accomplish bringing these roads up to county standards. Uh, in a lot of instances, the petition doesn't go any further because either uh, the cost is prohibitive and people, uh, people uh, so choose not to go ahead and expend their funds to bring the roads up to county standards. Uh, traffic counts don't have any bearing on uh, whether the county, in our current procedure, on whether the county accepts a road for maintenance or not, uh, either in tertiary or regular maintenance. Uh, the only thing that uh, does count is that they follow the statutes and bring the road up to county standard at no cost to the county. So if that's accomplished, the, we would bring the uh, road back in front of the board to make a decision on whether you all believe there's a public need and necessity and want to accept the road into our maintenance system. Um, if the local residents bring the road up to standards, are we required to accept it? No, sir. Okay. The uh, next question I have is, when I was reading through the materials, and again, perhaps I missed it, I saw nothing regarding the cost of maintenance on the road. What's it going to, what, how much dollars are going to come out of the public's budget every year to keep the roads maintained? Uh, Mr. Mr. I, I say this only because I look at most of these issues as a cost-benefit analysis, absolutely. and I was looking for that information in the packet, and I really didn't see it. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Mr. Moss, absolutely. Um, if I can, and that's, that's an excellent question. Uh, the amount of roads that are being petitioned that you see, it, it looks like a lot of roads, but uh, in, in essence, it's less than 1% of the uh, total roads that we maintain as, as dirt roads. So there's not a, a, a great amount. I think the influx is because we've got a new board. Uh, the influx is also because we've had a moratorium on for some time, so there's uh, been quite a few petitions mm -hmm. come through. We're looking at uh, five point. 03 miles of regular maintenance being requested that the board take a look at, uh, 8.25 miles of tertiary maintenance, regular maintenance, um, and uh, Steve, and Steve Latowski and I have discussed this before, and it's difficult to put an actual cost on it, but to give you a feel for costs, um, we're looking at probably 25 at, on the uh, upside, about $2,500 per lane mile are per mile per year, per road mile per year cost. So uh, uh, five uh, for regular maintenance and for tertiary maintenance, if I'm not mistaken, Steve, it's about, uh, I'm gonna throw out a figure of $500 per mile uh, per year for tertiary. And so we'd be looking at a total of less than uh, $15,000 in uh, 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 impact total on these petition requests. Uh, to our regular maintenance budget. That's the only questions I had. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Certainly. <coughs> Mr. Uh, John. Mr. Hendricks, that is if, if those roads are next to another road. If, we, if it's a tertiary road that's farther away, then we have a lot of time for our man to drive all the way out there to do the tertiary maintenance. Wouldn't that be true? I mean, uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Johnson, one of the requirements for the, the, that we have for uh, us to recommend that a road be accepted into the county maintenance system for maintenance is that it has to be connected to a road that's currently being maintained. So we don't, we don't uh, lift the blade up and road our blades to a road to maintain it. You know, uh, generally the road, or in, in all cases, the road is uh, connected to a road that's currently being maintained. And what we would do when we accept a road for maintenance, we look at our remote blades are on a circuit, so we try to uh, not have them chase maintenance. We have them on a, on a uh, scheduled circuit, so they're, they're on a route, and they're more efficient that way. And we would just uh, find the best uh, particular blade, blade route to put one of these roads on, and then to include it in as efficient uh, manner as possible. 
All right, and then you said it's $2,500 a year to maintain the improved roads? Or $2,500 a mile? For a dirt road to, to maintain on a, uh, under regular maintenance, and, and we maintain those dirt roads. We <laughs> like to try to target uh, blading them once a month. Uh, sometimes it extends to twi uh, once every two months. Right, thank you. If I could follow up. You mentioned, a, you mentioned a $500 per mile cost during your initial statements. What did that, did I miss here or did that connect to something? One of the things uh, the statute allows for, and, and the statute that we uh, look at regular and tertiary maintenance under is in uh, 2867.05. And uh, the statutes talk about uh, the county may spend public funds to accept a road for maintenance. Um, if it's brought up to standards at no cost to the county, and I'm paraphrasing. And then there's also a portion that allows us to maintain roads if there's deficiencies. And it's a, it's a big may for that. On what the county did, and I believe the early 90s, is, is uh, our regular maintenance is fairly expensive for somebody to bring a road up to that regular maintenance standard. So we worked with the county attorney's office. Actually, Bill and I worked together to establish a... Uh, a, what we call a tertiary maintenance program. And it's a, a much lesser standard what people have to bring the road up to, but it entails much less maintenance. And what the standard says is the road has to be 30 feet wide, uh, bladed uh, uh, to drain, uh, three inches or larger rocks removed from the surface. It doesn't have to go through any engineering or be designed. And, but uh, uh, with that said, the county uh, it's specified in this maintenance program that the county maintains those roads only once or twice a year and only after our regular maintenance is complete. So that the, the tertiary road system is the $500 per year cost yes, and the sir. 25 per mile and the $2,500 per mile road cost is in the regular maintenance system. Uh, yes, sir. And for the supervisor's information, I, I gave you some figures as I remember them for road maintenance. I think I'm pretty close. What I'll do is I'll have Steve refine those figures and I'll have him send that information out to all the board members. Is that your question? It does, and I, I'll make a motion if you'll let me. Sure, certainly. Okay. I move to approve items 50 through 61 and 64 through 69. I'll second your motion. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Item 64. 63. 63. Motion to discuss. Second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, <coughs> Chairman. Supervisor. Um, I just wanted to bring this out just so a matter of information for myself and, and maybe some of the newer supervisors. This has to do with um, frequencies that, that the county owns that we can lease out or sell or, or something. Is this, does this pertain to that? Oh, what, then what is this? Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Angus, this, this is a, Mr. Uh, a franchise agreement, I believe, with the cable company. We have any number of them in the county. They're statutorily provided for. Uh, there are fees paid to the county percentage of their gross profits, and uh, they are allowed to assign it with our permission. Oftentimes, companies grow or merge or change, and, and rather than go in for a brand new license, they just come in and get an assignment. So that's what we're doing. This is a standard 5% gross risk. That's the standard. Yes, it is. Okay, that's all. Mm -hmm. I guess, Mr. Chairman, if I may, also, uh, there should be public hearings on that, too, that, and they should notify the supervisor in the district where you can attend the local no that's all they're asking is for oh, a public it? hearing thank you supervisor Johnson. Mm -hmm. thank you uh, motion to approve second we have a motion and a second uh, any further discussion <coughs> there being none those in favor signify by saying aye aye aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carried I believe this takes us to item 76. Is that correct? We have this motion to discuss. 
Yes. Second. And I'll, I'll second the motion. Those in favor, second five, saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carried. Uh, actually, we were uh, asked by Chairman Fouché if we could have some type of meeting uh, where we could have a workshop between the Board of Supervisors and the Planning and Zoning Commission. And that's one of the reasons why I brought this item to you, to see if uh, we could identify, well, number one, identify the fact that you would like to have that interactive and workshop, and then if we do, identify a date of which we could do that. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess my question would be, the, what would be the point of this workshop? I mean, they're set by state standards from what they have to do. I don't, I don't know why, what, what the point of the workshop is, I guess. I'm not exactly sure what Chairman Flaché's uh, intent was, other than I think maybe he wanted to create a better working relationship. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I have a, uh, our Development Services Director, Nick Hunt, come to the Certainly. podium and answer that question? Mr. Hunt? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> Supervisors. Um, this uh, meeting is actually in the bylaws of the Planning Zoning Commission, and uh, we don't ask for it every year, but we have uh, a bunch of new commissioners. Most of them are new, and uh, they are trying to define their limits uh, for uh, making recommendations for land use issues to the board. And uh, the Planning Zoning Commission expressed their wish to have a meeting with the supervisors to get some clear directions. And uh, we had some new statutes come into effect in the past uh, two years, land use statutes uh, that change our procedures and also uh, we changed our regulations. We regularly come here and ask for making amendments to our, our zoning ordinance and so forth. And so it would be a meeting that uh, they, uh, they would appreciate, the Planning Zoning Commission would appreciate to get some directions from the supervisors. And if the board wishes, we could uh, come up with some recommendations for, a, for an agenda and we could work with uh, Chairman Watson and Chairman Fluche if, if the board wishes to come up with, a, with an agenda, a specific agenda. I have a question. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. We have a question, Supervisor President. Yes, uh, Mr. Hunt, could this also be maybe the beginning of us working some things out so we could have some suggestions also for the general plan that we're going to need to start working on this next year? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Brotherton, uh, we would be glad to put that on the agenda. There have been quite a few questions about that, and uh, we would be glad to explain what the statutory requirements are for the general plan and also what uh, our general plan has uh, in you know, defining uh, the review and um, uh, basically uh, you know, every five years or every 10 years. And that, that would be a good forum to discuss that, what the board's uh, uh, directions would be in that regard. I think that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Mr. Chairman, I have a question, Mr. Hunt. Supervisor John? I guess you have an attorney that sits in these planning and zoning meetings publicly? Yes, sir. Uh, would he be the person to give these people their direction on, on, on what is legal and what's not legal? I mean, we have five people that sit up here who aren't a bit shy about giving their opinions. Um, some of us might be right, some of us might be wrong, but, but uh, I would think the attorney would be the person to let these people that, that, that we ask to sit on these boards to give them their uh, the legal definition of what their job is. I mean, they are set by statute. Is that how we, how we get these folks? I mean, we were required to have them. It wasn't something we just decided we would do on our own, and they make recommendations to the board that the board does, either can or cannot, or, do, or does not have to follow. I'm not sure what they're going to get from having a meeting with us that, you know. Well, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Johnson, thank you for that question. Uh, we have uh, Deputy County Attorney Bob Taylor who uh, attends these meetings. And, and actually, the, with the previous Planning Zoning Commission that before this board came in, uh, they had some confusions. And uh, so we had some workshops. and. Uh, uh, 
Bob Taylor set up an excellent uh, workshop and an outline where he uh, kind of uh, informed the commission about the laws governing the commission and the limits of their authority and so forth. And, uh, you know, we, we could uh, do that again with the commission or we could, uh, we could do it at this workshop if the board desires to do so. I guess my question is, you want to have the separation, or at least I think you know, the board wants to have the separation where the citizens review, reviews the planning and zoning, and they make their best recommendation with all the legal parameters to give to us. Now, what we do is our, but if we're going down just to dictate to tell these, these people who sit on the planning and zoning what to do, what do we need them for? That's just my question. Obviously, I'm not in favor of a joint joint <laughs> It appears that you're not in favor. I can see that. Thank you. Chairman, uh, how it was, how it was uh, d described to me was that they wanted some direction, like an, some kind of overriding philosophy that they can go by. That, that's what was told to me. I, I don't quite understand it myself. Okay. Well, and I, I guess, Mr. Chairman, with, with that, each member here places people on it. And, um, while people want to say that, oh, it's not a, you know, you should put somebody who disagrees with you, <laughs> that's not why you won. You know, you represent the majority of people who voted for you uh, on your appointments. So I would think if you came from, a, if, if you're, if you support development, then you would put people who are pro-development on you, wouldn't put somebody on who hates development. So I would think they had a good idea when you appointed them to the, to the board, but that's just me. I appreciate your comments, and I... I'm in communication with my board members from time to time, and uh, it's very, very good. But I think on just this one time, they're only asking for one, for one meeting, that I'll make a motion to accept the planning and zoning uh, request to identify a date and compile an agenda for a, a workshop. Second. Any further questions? Supervisor, or, I'm sorry, County. Administrator Hendricks. Mr. Chairman, I, I believe the item was, uh, and I'm not sure you're prepared to do this at this time, but I think it would, talked about uh, identifying a date. Or, I'm sorry, I'm mistaken. No, staff, that's fine. Yeah, staff can, will come back with a date. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, any further questions? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. I believe that brings us to the end of the consent agenda. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And it is now uh, approximately 11 o'clock. I wonder if we could have maybe a five minute recess. Hildy, you talk too much and drug public.
We'll reconvene this meeting under the heading of public hearing. Item number 84, we'll open the public hearing. Discussion, possible action regarding the adoption of Board of Supervisors Resolution number 2013-52 uh, for the recension and cause property to revert to from <coughs> general commercial to commercial manufacturing open lot storage zones to the previous zone of agricultural residential one acre minimum lot size for the failure to meet the conditions of approval as specified in board of resolution numbers 2006-516-2007-493-2009-213-2011-218-2012-11 which approved the rezone and extensions of time for a rezone of assessor's parcel number 228-26-005 in the South Mojave Valley vicinity near El Rodeo and Mountain View Drive. The commission recommended rescission by unanimous vote. <coughs> Anyone wishing to discuss item number 84? Anyone in the audience wishing to discuss item 84? I'll close the public hearing. Chairman, motion to approve. Second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Item number 85, open the public hearing for discussion, possible action regarding the adoption of Mojave County Ordinance number 2013-04, allowing the temporary implementation of open fire, campfire, fireworks, prohibitions, in areas of the county that are determined to be under extreme fire hazard due to drought and or other weather conditions. And we have several people willing, wishing to speak to that item. Mr. Darrell Rayburn. If you'll please state your name and address for the record. Will do. My name is Darrell Rayburn. I represent the uh, LEPC, which is the Local Planning uh, Committee, Emergency Planning Committee for the county. I also work for Fort Mojave Mesa Fire, so my profession is in the fire service. 
I'd like to uh, present to you or ask you to pass this ordinance because as part of you, your group, you have approved us in 1988 to come as a committee representing those people in the emergency response and of the community, the hospitals and the health services and that in preparing our community for disasters and for events that happen. And one of those is that you have seen in the newspaper in the last couple of years of the large forest fires and that that has happened. The other side that has happened is this fireworks ordinance that's have been going on for the last couple of years that our state has uh, started mandating us to do certain things. This ordinance gives us as a committee and you uh, a, a tool to work on and control those things that happen during extreme dangers. And as a LAPC chairperson, we look at these things because when we have evacuations going on, if there's a large fire in that, we have place put, you know, we have to find people to uh, and place them in homes or, or, or facilities if we have to evacuate it. We also have to come up with uh, plans to supplement the area if there's uh, um, ongoing work like there is in California on these forest fires, we help out by giving resources to them, the Red Cross and things like that. So we're totally in support of this. We really wish you would pass this ordinance and give us that extra tool so we can work with it. Question for Mr. Raver? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Assistant Chief Ted Martin. Good morning again, supervisors. Your name Chairman. and address for the record, okay. please. Uh, Ted Martin, I live at uh, 4020 North Guthrie in Golden Valley. I'm the assistant chief for Golden Valley Fire District. And again, I just want to relay uh, the support that the fire service organizations in Mojave County have uh, in your consideration to enact this ordinance that will provide a tool uh, for law enforcement and fire protection to provide uh, public safety to those that uh, don't understand the implications of what open burning and illegal fireworks uh, could have on the uh, environment and, and their neighbors. So again, thank you for uh, considering this ordinance and uh, we look forward to your passing it in a uh, positive direction and utilizing it as a tool for, for public safety in Mojave County. Thank you, Chief Martin. Questions? Thank you, sir. Chief Patmore. Good morning, Chairman, members of the board. Patrick Moore, Fire Chief, Northern Arizona Fire District. Uh, in the sake of brevity, I support uh, what these guys have already echoed to you guys. And so uh, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Any questions for Chief Moore? Okay, thank Doesn't you. Doesn't appear like there's any questions, and thank you very much for all your assistance with us, uh, Chief. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Okay, we'll close, <coughs> close the public hearing, and we have a motion for approval. Second. And a second. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Item number 86, open the public hearing, discussion, possible action regarding the recorder's office fee for commercial use access to the affidavit of property values by FTP for $70 per month. Do we have anyone wishing to speak to this item, 86? Is Carol Meyer available in the audience? <laughs> Would you like to make a comment? Uh, my name is Carol Meyer and uh, my residence is here. <laughs> I live here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this fee, um, we have this fee established already, um, but it goes out on a CD. And what this is, it's everybody that uh, sells or buys a property has to fill out this affidavit, and it's by state statute. Um, we have been asked 
that if we could put it out on the website so they can just pull it down. It's the same fee for the CD. Um, we're just presenting it to you as, as another fee. And this fee was also um, derived from um, the office of OMB. So. OMB. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Meyer. I have a question. question. So right now, if they get the CD, they have, there's a fee of $70, correct? Right now. Mm -hmm. So you want to put it um, and another way they can get it from the website, and it would be a $70 fee. Right, How would that be collected from the website? Um, we bill them monthly. Oh, you bill them, okay. Mm -hmm. They have to fill out a document, and then we bill them. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Meyer. Close the public hearing. <coughs> we'll entertain a motion. I move to approve um, item 86 regarding the recorder's office fee for commercial use access to the affidavit of property values by FTP of $70 per month. I'll second the motion. <coughs> Questions? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Item number 87. Open the public hearing for discussion, possible action regarding the adoption of board resolution number 2013-025, establishing pond transaction fees pursuant to Arizona revised statutes 11-251-08 and 11-251.13. We have a number of people willing to speak to this item. Amber Smith, would Amber Smith care to speak to this item? Good morning, I'm Amber Smith and I live at 2104 McCulloch Boulevard, Lake Havasu City, Arizona. We own a pawn shop in Lake Havasu and these fees and reporting to this leads online would just be detrimental and my customers would not be happy. They're, they're already being feed, you know, ticket fees, pawn fees, we're being charged so much money as it is as a pawn shop. We pay county fees, we pay city fees, we pay state fees, and it's just not right. The, and also the leads online, um, they've admitted when I spoke to them that they're not, it's not legal for us pawn shops or banking institutions to report to a third party entity and leads online is a third party. It's against the Privacy Act all the way around there. I mean, you don't want to be, you don't want somebody to go in the bank and ask information about you or are myself, honestly. And I think it's also taxing the poor because I would have to put those fees onto my customers. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I have a, I have a question. question, Mr. Chairman, if I may. What Mr. fees do you pay the county? I pay $500 to the county for a, pawn, for a pawn license and I have to pay $100 to the city for a city license. And now they want a, a dollar a fee, a dollar a ticket. That's just wrong. Can anybody explain to me what the bond fee is? Yeah, we have to pay a bond fee. I don't know what the numbers are, though. But that's to the county? I don't know if it's to the county or to the state, but we do have to pay a bond. Okay, because I, don't, I, don't, I didn't know the county had any fees at all. That's why we have to pay a $500 pond fee to the, to the county sheriff. How, how many transactions do you think you do in a year? I do a year? Um, probably a thousand or more. Just depends. Right now, we used to do more, but right now with the economy, it's right. just, it's getting worse. So, and I know the other some of the other shops are busier than I am, sometimes, and sometimes I'm busier than they are. But we're just a small, you know, small family-owned business, and I know that there's 12 or 13 pawn shops in in Mojave County, and if they tax each of them a dollar a ticket, and Leads Online only charges six thousand dollars a year, I mean, where's the rest of the money going to go? Uh, to me, that's astronomical. I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Moss. When you report information to Leads Online, what information are they requesting, personal information are they requesting that you transmit to this entity? I do not use Leads Online currently. Like, I only send all my pawn tickets to Lake Havasu PD, and they want, it's state regulated that we have to have their first, middle, and last name, their driver's license number or passport, uh, their address, phone number, and we do a thumbprint as well. Do you know whether leads in line request that same information I or not? I believe they are going to want to, yes. And they're also, the Sheriff's Department's wanting pictures of our customers. To me, that's asking our, our customers to be mugshotted, and they're not even criminals. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. Next person signed up to speak is Stephen Bush. Good morning, uh, Chairman Watson, uh, Supervisory Board. Uh, again, my name is Stephen Bush. I live at 1890 KC Drive, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89119. It's regarding uh, 1963 Highway 95, Bullhead City, Arizona, 86442, and 4760 South Highway, 90, Highway 95, Fort Mojave, Arizona, 86426. Uh, Easy Pond is, uh, is committed to the neighborhoods that we serve and um, uh, provide uh, loans and uh, for those who have financial needs in, uh, in, in our communities. So um, it's uh, why I'm up here is not, not for much the fees, um, but I've been asked to request uh, additional time uh, with the thumbprint device that'll be soon coming out, um, we need uh, we need additional time to uh, uh, make sure that our systems are uh, compatible and uh, we have a seamless transition from the thumbprint device uh, to our record keeping and then reporting to leads online. So uh, we're asking for additional 60 days uh, uh, to comply with that. Thank you. <coughs> Any questions for Mr. Bush? Mr. Bush, you, you say you have two pawn shops and they're, they're bigger, you're out of Vegas. Yes. Just estimating, how many transactions do you believe uh, you a one, one, uh, one store, 23,600 transactions per year. Wow. Is that, is that a local store? That's, uh, that would be a, a representative uh, a Bullhead and, and, and Fort Mojave. Not, so it's basically forty six, forty seven thousand dollars. Okay, that's your get my follow. So you're looking at forty six thousand transactions a year on average through your two stores. Correct. Any further questions? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Bush. <coughs> Jerry Hom Homer. Yes, uh, Chairman Watson, Board of Supervisors, thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm on Pond World 1 and please, 2. Please state your name and address. Oh, my name is Jerry Homer, 2720 North Apache, Kingman, Arizona. I own Pond World 1 and 2 here in Kingman, Arizona. Uh, my concern about this dollar a ticket fee is I do believe it is too much. The Sheriff's Office did a survey. They never got back to it me on the numbers. They never even said that they even got our survey. I asked them. They said they got some. They didn't get some. I don't believe their numbers are right. I also asked, uh, like, Lieutenant Sonne if they included the pawn license fees, and they stated that they hoped they were included. But a dollar a ticket is a lot. We in the city of Kingman already get charged three dollars a ticket fee. But I stated this to the Sheriff's Department, and they stated it's not their problem, which it isn't their problem. It's my customer's problem. But at a dollar a ticket, it's just a little high. At 50 cents a ticket, I do over 12,000 ponds, new ponds every year. This would raise over 6,000. I pay 1,000 in pond license fees. At 50 cents a ticket, I would eat the fees. I wouldn't, I wouldn't pass them on to my customers. They're already paying enough at $3 a ticket. And I believe that the way these fees were came up with uh, Deputy Sheriff McCabe stated that they would have to pay dispatchers to put the information into the system. This is not true. Every day when we use Leads Online, this stuff would automatically be put into Leads Online, downloaded electronically. So I believe this wouldn't be an expense. Plus, Leads Online would be a time-saving thing where they wouldn't even need have near as many expenses as they have now they could just check on leads online and that's basically all i want to say i just think it's too much and i would eat the 50 cent fee if they can make it 50 cents like the other guy said he does 23,000 transactions how much money do you need yeah, i have a question if i could mr chairman Supervisor Ma. um do you currently use leads online to the city of kingman uh, no, I don't, but I'm not opposed to using these online if it helps catch criminals. Do you I just know? want a reasonable ordinance. Right. 
Um, do you know what information leads online requests to be passed on to them? Yes, the same thing as the state ordinance, the driver's license, the physical description of everything, make, model, and serial number when we do TVs, guns, stuff like that, jewelry, any owner numbers put onto it. If they painted it green, we noted it painted it green. All this would be on the ticket. I'm going to get into the photographing when you call me back up, but I was just wanted to talk about this dollar a fee first. Um, I think 50 cents would be more than reasonable. I think the pawn shops could afford to eat it where they don't have to pass it on to their customers, your constituents. And I, I have another follow-up question, no, Mr. Mark. Chairman. Um, approximately, you, you have 12,000 pawn tickets that you do per year on average? Yes, sir. Um, approximately how many of those are flagged as being um, stolen goods? Do you have an idea of the percentages which are? Uh, yes, I do. I was going through our computer programs. We have under 2,000 a year the last two years of stolen items that have been confiscated from our items, from our pawn shops. Mm -hmm. And we do over a million dollars a year per pawn shop in pawns. So is that 2,000 items over the last how many years? Each year. Each year. So. That's combined between the two pawn shops. So is that that's one? That's less than maybe one-tenth to two-tenths of one percent. Well, see, that's why the math's not making sense. If it's 12,000 transactions per year and you got 2,000 per year, being flagged, that's one in it's six. It's not two thousands, two thousand dollars in merchandise, which oh, might okay. be 10, 10 transactions. Okay, total. the number of transactions is ten. Yes, out of, that's what I meant. Out of twelve thousand. Okay. Yeah, I do that, twelve thousand transactions. Maybe ten or twelve of them got are it. confiscated. That makes a lot more percent. Yes, it does. Sense. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> After your question. Thank you, Mr. Homer. All right. Thank you. Rosa, would you care to speak? Please state your name and address for the record. It's Rosalva Homer, and I live at 2720 North Apache, Kimian, Arizona. And Chairman and Supervisors, I just want to appreciate you taking the time out and hearing us all. And I'm in agreement with my husband, of course. That was Jerry that was just up here. And uh, 50 cents a ticket, I think, is more than a fair for our customers, you know, for us to pay for our customers. Um, we, we don't like criminals. We, we are totally in support of the leads online. We have no problem with that. We're already computerized. We have no problem spending an extra 15, 20 minutes at the end of the day to upload what they require of us. Um, it's just the fees that we're concerned with right now at this particular minute. And I, I recommend 50 cents a ticket as well. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for Ms. I have one question. What's the number of transactions a year does your shop do? Well, between the two locations, it's 12,000 new pawns. That, and that's not counting our uh, repeat customers that bring the same item in maybe every month or whatnot. Okay, and were you with the last gentleman who spoke? That is my husband, yes. Okay, so I don't, I don't, I don't want to double count the numbers. Right, that's I got double check. Right, Thank and we you. run both of our locations here in Kingman. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Homer. Thank you. I see Chief. Deputy McCabe in the audience. Would you care to speak, sir? Is that all for the public hearing, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I wanted to include this portion of the public hearing. Oh. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, honorable board, and staff. Um, what the Sheriff's Office has proposed is what's been speaking on is to join a program called Leads Online. Leads Online is a database that goes nationwide for pawned items. And what that allows us to do is the opportunity to check with pawn shops nationwide as to where items are stolen from Mojave County so that we have a recovery and hopefully a prosecution. Uh, Leads Online gave us the program for uh, a trial run and in fact that did happen. We had uh, victims in Florida that we recovered merchandise stolen out of Arizona, Mojave County that was pawned in Las Vegas. And what this does is it gives us a great deal of flexibility to locate the merchandise. Um, <clears throat> the actual cost, when we first started looking into this, we looked into just putting Mojave County as a law enforcement agency, Mojave County SO, on Leads Online. It was going to be approximately $6,000 for that price. But once we announced that, 
I was contacted by all the chiefs of police of all the cities. And they said, you know, we really want to be a part of this as well because it would be much more cohesive if all the cities were online as well as the unincorporated areas and give us a much stronger tool. So Lieutenant Sonier, who has um, spearheaded the project, um, got with Leeds Online people and they made a basic package deal. And that ba basic package deal uh, turns out to be $17,246 per year. Now we've heard some talk today about, you know, I said some dispatchers and, and whatever. And the truth of the matter is I don't, I don't recall saying anything about dispatchers, but we do have, every agency has their own pawn shop detail as Boyd City Police Department, Lake Havasu City Police Department, and the Kingman Police Department, and the Sheriff's Office. We all have our own detail that we work. And so there is other costs associated with working pawn shops, not just the $17,246 it would be for the online service. So there are more costs, but the truth of the matter is, <clears throat> the numbers we're hearing here, both from myself and, and, the, and the, the pawn shop owners, the numbers are rather arbitrary. Um, we did send out surveys, and we asked all the pawn shop owners to give us their transaction numbers per year much as Supervisor Moss is doing today. And out of that, we got back four out of the 11 pawn shops. So we kind of went with that number. This is what it's gonna cost us. This is the number we, we have been returned that says we're going to reap, and that's where we came with a dollar per slip. Uh, but listening today to the owners, and there is going to be more transactions given than we anticipated or that we received information on, uh, the sheriff's office uh, would have no problem with reducing that fee to 50 cents a slip. Um, certainly, you know, we're looking at this as a tool, a tool to fight crime, uh, a tool to get stolen merchandise back, a tool to put people in jail, not a tool to be an obstacle to any of the businesses here in Mojave County. We want to be in partners with the pawn shops. We want to work together, and we think and I'm sure some of the, actually one of the pawn shops in Mojave County is actually already on Leeds Online. Um, and we think this is a tool that would help not only the Sheriff's Office, but the pawn shop owners as well. I have a question. Supervisor Mark? Um, do you know what third party information Leeds Online requests? What information from the pawn transaction they request and to be passed on to them? And has anyone looked into whether it's legal, maybe Mr. Ekstrom would know, to give uh, that to a <clears throat> private corporation? We do, and we have. Uh -huh. And uh, Lieutenant uh, Sony has the statute on that, if you want to read it. Uh, basically, what leads online is, by the state, is an agent of the law. What we would give them is the same information that we already get. It's not any different than what we already receive on the pawn shop slips. It just, it's in a centralized bank that we can access. My, the, I think the concern is, is, since it's a third party reporting agency, what happens to that information? So, you know, you walk into a pawn shop and you do it, you know, you assume because you're in the pawn shop, you know it's going to go to law enforcement, but now it's going to a third party. What are they doing with it? Can they sell it? Can they? And I looked at it and I actually downloaded, I copied the web page from Leeds Online, and it's a private company and they they work with private businesses so I'm a little un, you know uneasy with that aspect of it okay well first off uh, supervisors uh, the bill that they're talking about is the Graham Leach Billy Act prohibits the dissemination of financial information outside of law enforcement uh, leads online while under contract with us if it does occur will be an agent and therefore can accept this information on our behalf. It says under here, uh, section 521C of the act, no provision of this section shall be construed so as to prevent any action by a law enforcement agency or any officer, employee, or agent of such agency to obtain customer information of a financial institution in connection with the performance of the official duties of the agency. Whereas Leads Online would become our agent, uh, they can accept that information for us. I have a follow-up question, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Moss. 
But do we have any sort of like confidentiality agreement with Leads Online? Have we looked into what they do with the information once they get it? So that statute indicates that correctly that we can pass the information on to them, but what do we do to ensure that they're not doing anything other financially motivated, like selling the information um, to other persons? I mean, do we even know? I mean, it's possible that they have confidentiality provisions and we- I believe they do. The state of Arizona has been promote, promoting the uh, Leads Online program, and it actually all started with metal theft. And so, you know, it, it, they all have, also have a very good metal theft program. I know that, um, Mr. Chairman, you, you're aware of the, on the strip, all the items that we've had stolen in uh, District 2 from MEC, all the copper stripped. And this is really a, a, a tool that law enforcement started looking for years ago when there was nothing to address it. And the state accepted Leads Online as an agent to help us accomplish that. As a, then it also has the, um, the, the, the pawn shop ordinance in it. Um, basically, what I've heard here today was uh, exception to a cost of a uh, dollar per slip, and, but they feel that 50 cents would be acceptable and the sheriff's office would be acceptable that as well. The other thing that I heard here today was um, they don't like the, the uh, photograph of uh, their person, the, their, their customers. And, um, I've heard a couple of different reasons. One is an invasion of privacy. One is it would take too long and interrupt their workflow during the day. Um, the sheriff's office has requested that it be a photo for the purpose of identification, obviously. Now, they do have to, according to state statute, provide a thumbprint. But unfortunately, a lot of their thumbprints that they were doing were not legible. So they, we couldn't use them for identification purposes. However, w once again, to to help be with uh, part of the community instead of part of something that is an obstacle, we'll waive the photograph. And we also will provide an electronic scanner that will take the, th the thumbprint to each one of the, the shops and we'll, we'll do that out of these fees. Give each one of the shops an electronic scanner, take their, their thumbprint and we'll use that for identification. So that should eliminate that problem. And as far as time is concerned, we never really, uh, had any intention of beginning the program today. We'd like to see it go into effect uh, on the fiscal year. Did you have another question? Can, can we maybe bring this all back? I, I just really want to know about the issue about leads online. If, um, where that, if they're by law, they need to keep that information private or there's something, because that, that's a big issue with me. That's a privacy issue. This may be part of what you're looking for. Part of the contract with us, and under that contract, uh, the responsibility of LEADS, LEADS agrees to operate, maintain a database for the purpose of receiving data for reporting business. LEADS also agrees to provide reasonable instructions procedures for the input of data by reporting business. LEADS agrees to limit access to the data to those law enforcement agencies that are permitted to access such data pursuant to applicable law. In particular, leads shall not, well, correction, leads shall limit disclosures of financial data in accordance with the GLBA exceptions. Leads agrees to secure the data using commercial, commercially reasonable administrative, technical, and physical controls as required by the GLBA safeguards rules. That's part of the contract that we would be going into with them. May I make one more comment? Supervisor Mr. Mark. Chairman, um, I just wanted to say thank you to um, Mr. McCabe, because it occurred to me where I was listening here with the photographs and the thumbprints, and I guess one gentleman had 12,000 transactions with roughly 10 or so were bad, that we're turning, um, pawn shops are banks for poor people. They don't have credit. They can't get a loan from the bank. And they're very poor people, and they got to hawk property in order to get cash. And But the, just because they're poor doesn't mean they're criminals. And it seems like part of what we were seeing in the packet was you know mugshot fingerprint and now you're permitted to borrow money to feed your family this week and I thought that was somewhat dehumanizing so thank you Mr. Chairman thank you Mr. Supervisor, Supervisor. <coughs> Johnson I, I guess Lieutenant Sonier kind of answered the question I, I figured that was the answer I mean if if leads is being used by the state and other people nationwide they would have a contract that would because there are a 
an arm of the law, so they would have the same requirements that, that we would have. Um, as far as the fingerprinting going for not doing the photograph, if someone takes a fingerprint on this uh, new system that you have, do they get a reading back saying fingerprint is good, fingerprint is bad? How do they know? I mean, I'm just familiar with the old ink. ink. I know, I, as, as my, myself too. As a matter of fact, when I was talking about this program, I said, well, uh, one of the problems we're having is identifying the fingerprints. Maybe we, we can uh, teach them how to roll better and, and get a, a positive idea that way. And Lieutenant Sonia advised me that we have an FBI-approved scanner available for $70. We have seven or 11 pawn shops in Mojave County. Of this fee, we'll buy them that scanner, and that scanner will tell them if they have the right roll as they're doing it. So. It's basically a foolproof system. It's nothing that's going to cost them any more money. It's nothing more intrusive because we're already getting a, a thumbprint, but it would actually be identifiable. And with that, then I feel comfortable with leaving the photo part off of it. Right. And if we could get a maybe come back with a review in six months to see how those are going, because just like you're saying, it's not doing us any good to go to all this if we can't identify the person that's um, actually getting the money. It is, and actually when I talked to some of the pawn shop owners, and, and certainly with the, you know, we had as many questions from the police departments, and this is a new program, and it is cutting edge, and it, it is, is something that I think it's <clears throat> going to be a, not only a benefit to uh, the residents of Mojave County that are so often victims of thefts, but it's going to actually be a benefit to the pawn shops as well, and certainly to law enforcement. Um, that being said, I don't have a history of it, and I can't come before and say, I know this is how it's going to work, and I know how much this is going to cost. So I would suggest to the board that possibly, like I said, we do this based on a fiscal year, and we can take a look at a history then after this, this next year going forth. We can take uh, look at the history and see how much money was collected, how much money was expended, and how did it work. And, and possibly we can come up with another arrangement and have a sit down with uh, the, the police departments within the county as well as the, the business owners with the county, and we can all go to lunch and sit down and say, this is where we're at, and, and address it again this time next year. Yeah, I, I guess going on with that, there's a lot of talk about this as a, you know, the people who are using this and we might be infringing upon their, their civil rights, but it's for their protection as well as everybody else because if you're a poor person, you can least affect to have your stuff stolen from you, so getting that stuff back would, um, that's what this is all about, recovering. It is. It's property. certainly not, we're, no, we're not trying to impose anything up upon uh, anyone else than the criminals that are taking something out of your dresser drawer. Right. And then, now this will basically, Right now, the way it stands in, in Mojave County, Lake Havasu City, nor the Sheriff's Department charge any kind of pawn fees. We don't have a pawn fee. There is a pawn licensing fee of $500 per, um, which is actually comes to the general fund. It's not part of the Sheriff's Office budget. I would assume, though, it helps offset that. But, but the cities of Kingman and Bullhead have a, have a pawn fee that they charge per item. Now, is, is it true that uh, Kingman is willing to maybe work inside the fee they have so that it wouldn't cost their pawn shops or the people any more money. It would, it would just be absurd. Correct. When I talked to Chief DeVries last week, he said that that was a possibility that they were looking at. Um, with the reduction, with the sheriff's office saying they would reduce the fee, I don't know if that's exactly right, if that was necessary still. any longer. But And the fees that are collected now what in Kingman is what, $3 a transaction? That's you know, correct, yes. mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what Bullhead City is. Brian? One dollar, and go ahead. Oh, okay. And have us, I believe, is zero. zero. And the sheriff's office is zero. Yeah, that, that's all I have. Sure. And I might add that we have the, as far as state statute, we're, we're allowed to, by state statute, up to five dollars per transaction. So our initial request was fifty or uh, one dollar, and I would like to formally change that to request fifty cents, based on the testimony that I've heard here today from the owners of the businesses. I have a question, Chief Deputy. Uh, in a situation in which you may have a, a pawn shop that is not uh, technologically up to date, how would that person, as an owner, get all that information to to you folks? You know, um, f frankly, it, it's kind of very basic information that they're filling out. The same information that they are now using long form on a on a slip would be done on a laptop computer, just filled in the, fill in the blanks. And then if we provide them with the, 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 the laser print, that's basically it. 
Uh, I was talking to a, a gentleman that has a, a pawn shop, and he's, he, he told me he's not very technologically updated, and he was concerned about not only the dollar, but also having to report it every night. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could certainly see his concern, and having been in business for a number of years, to have to end the evening with another report. But that's kind of the nature of their business. It is, um, and I, I believe the, the actual reporting period is 24 hours. Is that right, Lieutenant? Yeah, and currently what we do is require them to bring the hard copy down to the police station. So it's probably more, a lot more time consuming. Mm -hmm. well, and we I'm would certainly, certainly be happy certainly to sit down. I'm certainly in favor of a number of aspects of the entire program, uh, but it sounds to me like if we were to jump in and improve it today, we're kind of approving the whole universe of possibilities. What I think I would like to see is maybe the sheriff's department and the pawn shop working together to maybe simplify and, and bring, you know, a little bit better cost up front for initial approval. Uh, but I, I'm just sharing those items with you. Yeah. you uh, Supervisor Moss? I would um, echo your sentiments, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, it seems to me, because I did the math on the three pawn stores that talked today, they have 59,000 transactions between them. Um, and I'm, I'm not certain that OMB's numbers were 100% accurate. Um, and I think we need some time to look into that. I also think we need look time to look into the um, coordination between the Sheriff's Office with Kingman and Bullet City regarding the fees which are charged and how it will impact because the, the customer. Because let's keep in mind, this is additional cost monies which the, the citizens will have to pay back. In other words, we just made their loans a lot more expensive. Right. Um, so it's a you know, $100 transaction. We just added 1% to their interest rate um, to find out whether or not the fees are um, uh, directly related to the costs that we're going to assume and um, also to streamline the ordinance because I understand we have two in front of us, one which deals with mug shots which has another fee associated with it and the other which involves this um, reporting on a daily basis and I think coming back on May 20th might be a good idea. I might give them a time. There's only 11 pawn shops from what I heard so mm -hmm. getting them on the phone and talking to them shouldn't be too hard. So your I would motion make, to I would make a motion to continue this item until the May twentieth meeting to give uh, the sheriff's department and the um, the various pawn shops a chance to coordinate a better, more streamlined ordinance. I second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions? Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. It will be carried forth till May twentieth. Thank, Thank you very much. Chief Deputy. Uh, was that, both, that was both items, 87 I intended it to apply to 87 and 88, which is why I referenced the mug shots and whatnot. Okay. Just wanted to make that clarification for our clerk. Thank you. Uh, item number 89, uh, open the public hearing. Uh, discussion, possible action, approve and authorize the chairman to sign on behalf of the Board of Supervisors. BOS Resolution Number 2013-047, establishing Santa Fe Drive from Industrial Boulevard to Olympic Way. Number two, Finance Way from Commerce Drive to Flatline Drive. And number three, Shipping Lane from Mojave Airport Drive to Finance Way. As county highways for the purpose of accepting these paved roads into the Mojave County Road Maintenance System. And I have motion to discuss. Second. Okay, this is the public hearing, but no. that's fine. Okay, well, <laughs> we're we're getting anxious. Sure. We have uh, we have Steve Robinson that would like to address this item. Okay, Mr. Robinson is not here. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak to this item? I see Mr. Riley in the back room, and I've got a couple questions for him. Mr. Riley, would you mind coming to the podium? Chairman Watson, members of the board, Bob Riley, Director of Economic Development for Kingman Airport Authority, 7000 Flight Line Drive, Kingman. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. 
Thank you, Mr. Riley, and thank you for coming today. <clears throat> uh, several months ago, you supplied to me, and I think the rest of the board, the uh, impact that the Mojave County Airport Industrial Complex uh, initiates in tax dollars each year. And that's a pretty overwhelming number. And I, the point I'm getting to is uh, a comment made by Supervisor Johnson at one of our last meetings that uh, where the, some of this money goes to as far as your organization, the Airport Authority. And it's my understanding that the Airport Authority, when selling or leasing property, that those dollars go to the airport function. Is that correct, Mr. Reddy? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, that is correct. Uh, the governance that was established under the release of the World War II Army Surplus Property Act, allowing us to sell property within the industrial park, uh, states that the net proceeds of the land sales must be utilized for airport improvements within five years of the date of the sale. Uh, we are not in a position that we maintain uh, any roadways we do develop roads in accordance with uh, industrial standards established through the, through the county at the time of a land purchase. But as with any other subdivision, once they're developed, uh, they're basically given to the county for maintenance. What? Supervisor Johnson? Yes, obviously I have questions. I know you'd want to jump in. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, going back, this was, this, this airport belonged to the county. We gave it to the city, who gave it to the airport authority to run. And, and you're correct in the fact that the sales of land goes for airport improvement, which would be roads, in my opinion. It's not up to the, up to the county taxpayers to pay for the roads uh, that go into your, your park for you to make money. I guess that's, that's my, and, and I not Chairman Watson, not supervisor, supervisor about this. Yeah. But. Chairman Watson, Supervisor Johnson, uh, you know, this has been a discussion that's been going on for quite some time. The, the airport was given to the county uh, after World War II as part of the World War II Army Surplus Property Act. Uh, the reason there was a release to sell property is that under those provisions of that act, the federal government has the right to reoccupy in case of national emergency. The release through an act of Congress established the fact that um, any net proceeds of sales must be utilized for airport improvements. This is not a, uh, uh, it's pretty much non-negotiable. <laughs> it is an act of Congress. The, uh, uh, the interpretation, whether or not the roads within the industrial park are considered part of the airport, uh, that's been going on for years. The Airport Authority was established in 1979. We leased from Mojave County at the time the airport for management purposes. Uh, the county did relinquish control of the, the airport and industrial park to the city of Kingman in the 1990s. Our management agency, or agreement, uh, is now with the, with the city for the, the airport and promotion of the industrial park. However, the industrial park, uh, under the FAA guidelines and the uh, release of the land really is not considered to be airport in, in their eyes. I guess, oh, if I can, Mr. Martin, uh, Mr. Chairman, I guess then would the Air Park be willing to give all the lands they haven't sold back to the county and just keep the Air Park itself? Because if we're going to maintain the roads, then we should be the ones selling any property. Is there any property even left? Or for sale. There's approximately uh, 110 acres left in the original release. I would think that's something we should look at. If we're taking over the roads, we had to take over the property, so at least we got the value of the sale. Good point. Uh, however, I think under your agreement with the city of Kingman, when you transferred the property, I don't know that that's part of it. <laughs> I, I guess, and that's, that's what I'm getting at. We, we gave it to the city. You guys were for, for the city, but back we're back to the county looking for the taxpayers of the county to pay for these roads when all that money should be there. And it's not with you, Mr. Well, Riley. That's not just again, I'm just saying the Chairman the Watson. We have Bullhead City, the airport, the same setup there. They're not in here getting money from for roads. I mean, they and they put a lot of roads in there to their stuff too. So. Thank you, Supervisor Johnson. I do have Supervisor some, I do have some follow up. Um, <clears throat> Have we looked at any, 
Well, well first off, I saw in ref I read the agreement between the Kingman, between Kingman and Mojave County, and I saw a reference to an agreement between the United States and Mojave County dated November 3rd, 1980, but I didn't see that in the backup data, even though that agreement was referenced as being incorporated into the Kingman, Mojave County, so it's part of the deal, but I didn't see it in the information that was provided me. Um, so, and I may have missed it, but I simply didn't see it. Um, the, um, and there is some language in the agreement that does support what Supervisor Johnson is saying, because it basically turns out for all financial responsibilities to Kingman, um, and we have expressly disclaimed any and all financial responsibilities. So my question would be, um, I don't know if it's probably directed to you, sir, or to Mr. Ekstrom, if a private developer um, uh, were to own acreage and want the roads taken into the county, um, what's the difference between that situation and this situation? So, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Moss, uh, uh, a private developer, of course, would have to build the roads to county standards and a subdivision. Once that occurs, the county is required to take the roads into the system. That's found in our subdivision regulations. Okay. I don't view the airport as a typical subdivision, if you will, and I, th I think it exists uh, pursuant to these federal grants back in the in the 70s, and, and so I don't look at it as a subdivision. I want to so follow I don't think that those concepts would apply to the airport. I want to follow up something because I think it contradicts something Mr. Hendricks said earlier, and I want to make sure that I'm clear. If a developer develops a road's two county standards, are we required to take them into the system? In a subdivision, under the subdivision regulations. Only a subdivision. Only a subdivision. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman, yeah. uh, Supervisor Moss, it's also in 11.822 uh, statute that it says that once a developer constructs the roads to county standards, the county shall, within one year, accept those roads into the county. So, I mean, I'm going back to an older item on the agenda, but I thought you said if we approve this and a builder or a resident was to bring their roads up, to county standards, we were not obligated to take them into the system on the consent agenda roads that we just went through. Uh, if you remember one discussion that we had in a previous meeting, there's different types of roadways. Uh, mm -hmm. 11822 uh, refers to subdivision roads, and it's in the, uh, those statutes. Uh, I, the roads that, you, uh, that we contemplated today are being accepted under 286705, uh, and those are roads that are petitioned by residents or some uh, some other entity besides a subdivision that's wishing those roads to be accepted for maintenance. So they're not being brought in as part of an approved plat. They're already on that's a plat correct. someplace. That's correct, and, and uh, uh, 286705 right. is specific on that. Okay. Now, how do these roads compare to those two exceptions or those two circumstances? Okay. There's a third mm -hmm. mechanism. Uh, that uh, uh, we like to take in exceptional conditions. Let's say if there's a, a, a greater public benefit or a public purpose um, that the county can declare a road a county highway under 11, I'm sorry, 286701 and go through a public hearing process. And uh, uh, the board can, if they decided to declare uh, a road a county highway, it, it uh, in essence, wipes uh, wipes away any inconsistencies or any other parts of the statutes and allows the county to open up its checkbook to uh, lay out, construct, maintain uh, those roadways that they decide to declare county highways. And what is the cost to bring the roads up to standards? Because I saw some notations in the back of materials that they weren't up to standards in some places. And what's the cost to maintain those on a yearly basis? Uh, the roads would be accepted um, as paved roads, and uh, I believe Steve Letowski had a paper that was included in your right. In your I may have missed it, and I do do that sometimes. So if I have, I apologize. And, uh, I, I have got a I copy. Know, uh, on yeah. costs, I believe uh, if it pleases the board, I'd like to get Steve Letowski up here to address Please. those those uh, questions. Thank you, Mr. Riley, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. We may thank be you. calling you back. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, well, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Watson, uh, members of the board. Uh, the uh, uh, item before you is the uh, 
uh, acceptance of approximately 1.5 miles of hard surface or paved roads within the uh, Kingman Airport Industrial Area for uh, maintenance. Um, Mojave County um, Public Works engineers, uh, myself included, have uh, inspected uh, these roads and uh, we have deemed that uh, uh, should the board accept these roads for maintenance that there will be some substantial improvements that will be necessary. We do find that of the 1.5 miles, approximately 0.9 miles uh, will require um, pulverization and replacement of the pavement surface section. And we estimate that work to be approximately $120,000. The other 0.6 miles of roadways are in a satisfactory condition that would require only um, a pavement surface treatment, uh, a chip seal or similar. Um, should we uh, uh, embark on that type of pavement surface treatment, we would anticipate uh, that work to be a, an additional 30, about 35 to 40 thousand dollars. So we do anticipate our, our initial estimate is about 166 thousand dollars, <throat> inclusive of about a five percent contingency for uh, allowances uh, to. Uh, uh, take on these 1.5 miles of roadways and make the necessary improvements to uh, return the roadways uh, to uh, a serviceable condition for what is, uh, as you well know, a commercial and industrial area to be able to take on the uh, heavy truck loadings, et cetera. What would be the yearly maintenance cost for those roads as compared to, is it the same that we've heard earlier, or are they bigger or larger? Um, Chairman Watson, Supervisor Moss, that's a very good question. Uh, when it comes to paved roads, uh, unlike the uh, unpaved roads that uh, Mike so uh, eloquently outlaid, the uh, unpaved road maintenance costs, the unpaved road maintenance costs can be characterized very, very well because we operate motor graders on, on a circuit of routes and uh, we um, basically calculate that uh, per miles uh, uh, maintenance costs on the basis of of that motor grader operating, uh, the cost of the operator and the cost of ownership and, and maintenance of the equipment. On paved roads, um, they become really a function of the condition and characteristic of that paved road. Uh, in some instances, we have paved roads that uh, are, are far more structurally sound than other roads. And um, so as a, uh, off the cuff, I would say that uh, the cost per mile, if you spread it out amongst all our 787 centerline miles of paid roads throughout the county, it would certainly average at least uh, the figure that uh, Mr. Hendricks quoted with regard to the regular maintenance of unpaid roads. That's the $2,500 per mile, but it's probably a little higher than that. And that's to accommodate preventive maintenance such as uh, crack sealing uh, and a chip sealing. More questions? Okay. Do you have more questions? No, no more questions. Thank you. Mr. Latosky, I have one more person that would like to speak to this. That's Stephen Robinson. Thank you, Chairman Watson. I'm Stephen Robinson, 3439 North Bowie Road, Golden Valley. Uh, as we have clearly defined, there is cl clear differences between roads and highways. And when I just, based upon the figures that they just calculated, at $2,500 per mile for the 2,000 approximate miles of paved and unpaved, that's only about $5 million in cost to maintain the roads based upon your figures. The annual budget for her funds is over $10 million. And my question that just came up rather serendipitously is, what's happening to the other $5 million in the HERF funds? I was initially opposed to this and still am because if there is sources of funds, we should be using those sources of funds, the airport authority. In my own perspective from Golden Valley and feeling frustrated about maintenance there, today I happened to see as I was headed into town the, first, the second time since December, mid-December after a flood that they are grading my road, Bowie Road, as we speak. That's a, about a 10 week difference. And I think that's a little bit longer than the four to four weeks that, or once a month that uh, manager, administrator Hendricks had indicated in the past. So because of all that, 
I'm opposed to this unless we can make sure there's a better, more equitable solution for providing maintenance across the county wide. Because if it's only $2,500 per road and times 2,000 miles of roads, that's only $5 million. Where is the other $5 million going? Thank you. Mr. Robinson? Can I say something even if I wasn't? Yes, ma'am. Please just uh, come up to the podium and uh, give your name and address to the clerk. My name is Gina Lander, and I, um, I've been in the, this area for like since 1990. Uh, I'm now in Kingman, and we have a company, and we've been trying to relocate like into the airport. Um, the airport, the property taxes we find are really, really high out there compared to, compared to other areas. We've looked at going to Utah. Uh, we have 35 employees. It'd be nice if we can keep our company here in this area, but we are competing against the China country. You know, we manufacture here and we are manufacturing with, you know, American workers, American products and everything. And it's like our property taxes in that airport are like way higher than what we found in Utah. They're twice the amount. So we looked at a building there that's like, 16,000 square feet, the property taxes are $18,000 a year. So I don't know who I can talk to to find out what we can do to keep our company here, find out why the property taxes are so high out there. But that's just one building. So there's a lot of money revenue coming in, and I don't know where that money is going. It sounded <coughs> interesting that when they sell the property, that's supposed to be there for improving the roads. But the other thing, too, is like you guys need to look at the beauty of that development and you want companies to come here and I've driven on some of those roads and they're like appalling it's really terrible so it makes a company that comes in you know the curb appeal exactly my point I think Kingman really needs to look at the curb appeal and my opinion out there you guys have about maybe 40 percent vacancy and we've been up in Utah and they're building home they're building buildings they want people up there and the commercial area looks pretty. So I think there needs to be some improvement. That's all. Well, thank you very much for your comments. I have a question over, if I may. Certainly. Um, you've been involved in the improvement district projects in, in Mojave County before, haven't you? Yes, sir. In the one you were involved in before, and that was land that you owned and a road in front of the land that you owned, did anybody besides those friends and neighbors of yours that lived around you give you money for that road? No, we paid for it. That's, that's, that's all I had, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to speak to this item before we close the public hearing? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, I'm gonna beg the chairman's and, and the rest of the board's indulgence on this. Um, when I first when this is here last month, and I didn't, we didn't yet have the agreements that Mr. Johnson, Supervisor Johnson was referring to, I read it and then I thought to myself, well, I mean, he's got a good point. I mean, it does use the word all within the agreements. There is no exceptions for roads and everything else. Um, and now I hear, and I, from some of the statements, that there may be an overriding greater public good that needs to be served. Um, and I can certainly accept that. I would like the opportunity um, if I could go out to the, visit those roads and visit that complex over the next two weeks and push off a final decision on this item until May 20th, I would really appreciate that so I can, with my own eyes and own ears, evaluate this greater public good because I see the point. There's a lot of property taxes coming out of that area, and I'd like to see exactly what we're doing and where we're doing it. I'm sure Mr. Riley would love to give you that tour. I, uh, he gave me his card. <laughs> <laughs> Is that in the form of a motion to table? Yes, I move that we table item 89 until May 20th um, for myself and other board members to actually evaluate the on-site premises before determining the issue. I I'll second. Sec I'll second the motion. Okay. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. <clears throat> Item number 90. Discussion, possible action, the adoption of Mojave County Ordinance 2013-05, providing false information to or withholding information from the Board of Supervisors. This mm -hmm. item comes under the heading of Supervisor Moss. 
Mr. Chairman, if I may, I move that we continue item 90 to the May 20th meeting. I see that we're already a quarter afternoon and we still have a lot of work to do. And I would forbear discussion for a couple weeks in order to get through today's agenda and the public not being unduly burdened. I know there's people from Havasu and elsewhere who um, are anxiously awaiting their number. Okay. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Question? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Item will be brought back on the May 20th, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Item number 91, under the regular agenda, discussion possible action, reconsideration of board number resolution 2013, a renewal of a zoning use permit on the Cecil's parcel number 310-2508E and 310-2508F for a kennel in a vicinity <coughs> Agricultural residential five acre minimum lot size zone in the Long Mountain vicinity, Mojave County, Arizona, to allow the board to consider revising uh, the resolution 2013 031, allowing a renewal for three years instead of two years. Commission approved for a two year extension. I move to approve item 91. We have a motion. Second. And a second. Questions? Seeing no further discussion. Those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Item number 92, discussion, possible action, adoption of the board resolution, resolution number 213-31A, a renewal of a zoning use permit on assessor parcel numbers 310-25-008E and 310-25-008F for a kennel in an AR5A agricultural residential five acre lot size zone in the Long Mountain vicinity, <laughs> Mojave County, Arizona, to consider extending the zoning use permit period for three years instead of two years. Uh, as recommended for approval was two years from the commission. I move to approve item 92. We have a motion. A second. And a second for three years. Uh, questions? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Item number 93, <coughs> discussion possible action for clarification of the weapons policy as it relates to Mojave County libraries and the Lake Havasu City Central Complex and other leased facilities. And uh, Chair, will entertain a motion for discussion? So moved. We have a motion and a second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, folks, I brought this item back for clarification. I wanted to make <coughs> sure that everyone knew that in our libraries, there is a great extent of uh, preschool activities uh, where there are a large number of students in our libraries, uh, especially on the Kingman campus, where the uh, Kingman Charter School does not have a library. They use our county library as their library. So that's the reason I brought it back, is for clarification, knowing that there are a number of young people using our libraries, and it may relate to the same type of situation we have in other schools. With that, oh. Mr. Chairman, I mean, it's my understanding that what we voted on was that um, all buildings are gun friendly now, including our senior centers, libraries, everything we have. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Certainly. Um, I, my recollection is similar to Supervisor Johnson with the exception that buildings controlled by other elected officials such as the courts and sheriff's departments were exempted from that. Right, and the reason I'm bringing this back is we are that elected official. Right. And I've, I've not requested the signs be removed until we had clarification on this item. But uh, I wanted everyone's input. Uh, I'll start. Um, certainly. I, this is my philosophical view, and I know people as a practical matter may disagree with it, and I have no heartburn about it one way or the other. <clears throat> I'm just putting forward my personal worldview. 
mass murders and whatnot occur in schools because there's a sign saying no guns and the bad guy who's a psycho and usually on psychotropic drugs shows up and starts shooting kids because no, he knows there's no one there that can shoot back. Um, libraries are in that same bunch. I personally disapprove of the idea of a, a gun-free zone because all it does is keep the law-abiding citizen out of that zone and the guy who's gonna break the law is the one who's gonna cause the problems. I have that exact same philosophy to libraries. When I first brought this forward, I intended it to only be for this county administration so we'd have six months to test our way through and then over time have the administration build a list of um, sensitive buildings um, that we could exempt and then allow for all the others. Um, for a variety of reasons, it seems we moved um, a bit faster than that, which is fine. But um, I, I, I personally believe we should keep or allow both the public and employees the opportunity to carry a weapon in the library um, uh, subject to the county policy, it has to be in a scabbard. Um, and uh, when it comes to the Lake Havasu City Central facility, to the extent that's a judicial facility, the judges have every right to keep people with guns out because they're dealing with felons and they have armed security to deal with those felons. Um, and as to leased facilities, I'm not really sure what's meant by that, but to the extent that we are the leasor and we are occupying it, absent a sensitive reason that hasn't been produced to me yet, I'd be in favor of allowing employees and the public carrying a weapon there. To the extent that someone leases a building from us, like a member of the public under some of the um, residential housing rules that we may have out there, if, it's, if they occupy it, they should decide. Is, that's just my personal philosophical view. And since, the, Mr. Chairman, you asked me for my um, opinions on it, I've laid them out. <laughs> Thank you. And that's, what it's, that's why it's on the agenda for clarification. Um, I, I've received a lot of calls about the libraries. And I think, Julie, do you want to come down and, and talk to this? Thank you, Supervisor Angus. Good afternoon, Supervisors. Um, my opinion and the uh, feedback I received from staff, um, we are not in favor of allowing weapons in the libraries. Um, definitely, we have a lot of children in the buildings on a daily basis throughout the day. Um, in addition to that, uh, I feel that the atmosphere that we wish to uh, present in our libraries would be impacted by people carrying weapons. We have in the three, well, in all of our locations, we also have public computers that this, the, um, the general public can come in and use. These can be um, a confined area, number of people in a confined area. Uh, with varying opinions on what the person next to them is doing. Um, and we actually have had altercations in the libraries related to our public computers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I could see these situations being exacerbated by people carrying weapons. <coughs> Can I ask you a question? Yes, right now, you have a sign outside that says, no weapons allowed. Who enforces that? Uh, at the three branches, we do have um, security um, present. The uh, smaller locations, um, yes, we only have one staff person, and they would need to enforce it or request enforcement of it. Uh, we do have uh, gun lockers, weapons lockers at each location. And so individuals are requested to either secure the item in their vehicle, <coughs> pardon me, or uh, we will secure it in the gun locker for them. I have a question, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Supervisor Mark. The security um, at the three locations you referenced, um, it's actually two questions. Is the security armed or unarmed? They are not armed. So it's unarmed security. And how many locations, library locations are there? Ten. Thank you. 
I have a question for Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Johnson. This has been on the agenda numerous times. Why are you just now showing up with your objections to it? Initially, uh, it was my understanding that the um, um, proposal was only for this building, and uh, so that's why it may seem I'm a little late to the table with it. And then if, if the board has voted on this previously, why haven't the signs been removed that say no weapons allowed? I was directed to wait until this item came up today. Who directed you to wait? Um, County that Administrator and uh, Supervisor Watson. Thank you, Julie. Well, I guess the other question I would have is you, you allow backpacks in, right? Yes, sir. So we have people with bringing these monstrous backpacks all over the place when everybody knows that's how they're carrying most of their stuff in anyway. Uh, but you have no problem with everybody dragging in backpacks. I understand that uh, people can bring in uh, pretty much anything they would want if it's concealed. Um, whether there's uh, signs or not, of course, we're not going to have control over that. Um, generally, backpacks and other items, as long as they're not um, in and of themselves posing a, um, a safety concern, yes, they are allowed. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Johnson. may I provide a clarification? Certainly. Uh, even though uh, I believe the motion was to allow employees to carry on county property. I believe uh, the motion to allow the public to carry in internally to buildings was for this administration <coughs> building only. So that might answer some questions. Right. And that's uh, Mr. The, Chairman, that's the clarification I, I, I'm trying right to come to. Oh, okay. Well, I guess the, what I would say was if, if the uh, county administrator had a question about what the motion was, I guess at the time that it was made, we should have clarified it at that time so that we all knew exactly where we were at. And I'm, I've got the motion here. I, I didn't need a clarification. Right, thank you. Can I, did I just hear right? So you're saying that that the people can't go in armed, but the employees can to other buildings in the county? Well, what did? That is correct. That. Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Angus, that, that's my understanding. That's that's what was actually approved by the board. Okay. You know, this this whole art. This has been a a. That's why it's for Clarification yeah, today. but there's other clarifications now that I, I'm unclear about. Is there any way, again, maybe when we do the um, workshop for the um, planning and zoning, we can have a workshop so we get all of these issues because every time we come back, now it's been four months, we come back with, and every time I get a clarification, I learn something new. So I'm very confused. Can about I say? All of this. Can I say I told you so? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I, and I apologize for all this, but it's it's a complicated issue. Okay, I think we can clear up portions of this pretty fast. Mm -hmm. As I understand it, all of our employees carry the weapons. All of our employees can carry weapons throughout all the facilities in Mojave County. It's my understanding that the citizenry can enter this building with weapons this building only and this building only and that as I recall is is precisely what was in the motions can I make a motion mr. certainly Sherman? I move that we allow employees and the public um, to carry weapons in every county building accepting those only those buildings which are under the control of independent elected officials or otherwise labeled sensitive at a future meeting to be conducted within the next 60 days. I have a motion. Um, I'll second for discussion. Second um, for discussion. The, the question I had, what was about the 60 days? There's, I'm, as Ms. Uh, as Supervisor Angus has mentioned, and there is going to be confusion. Um, and so to the extent that the county administration wishes to exclude a specific building, I want to give them 60 days in order to give us a list so we're not doing this every month. Um, and I don't care if it's 30 days and I don't care if it's 90 days, but in some period of time, rather than this drip, 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 they need to come to us and say, uh, for example, the public defender's office. That would be a very good choice in my opinion. You can't carry a weapon in the public defender's office. The LDO, the appellate defender's office all for obvious reasons, because in the case of the appellate defender, they're dealing with convicted felons, <laughs> so not just accused felons. 
Um, but when it comes to um, employees and the public, unless it's under the direct control of another elected official who should be allowed to make a decision as to what happens in that person's building, the county attorney's um, buildings, for example, um, the judges, because they're also dealing with accused and convicted felons, that's up to them. That has nothing really to do with us. We're obligated to provide them a building. There's your building. Make what rules you like with your building. Um, so, And I guess that, um, for further clarification, I, I agree with what you're saying. Would it just be as good to say that all buildings, just like you're saying, under our control are open? Yes. And then if the sheriff or the county attorney uh, wants to post his, that comes out of his budget, he does whatever he wants. You don't want to list now, though? I mean, they could change their mind, you know, just with elections or whatever else. I mean, that's... I, I haven't um, even contemplated the budgets for putting signs for up and down. I just was enunciating for by my emotion the policy of this right. county. Who pays for what? We can work with that out later. Right, okay. And then in the public defender, the only disagreement I would have there is I don't think they have a choice because they have no elected official and th those are their clients anyway, so. Well, I, I believe um, <laughs> that, in fact, for ease of reference, I'll go ahead and amend my motion if I could, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I hereby move that all county buildings uh, be opened up to both the public and employees um, to carry weapons in conformance with already existing county public policy, which is that it must be in a holstered in a scabbard or in another container, um, excepting those buildings which are um, under the jurisdiction of another elected officials, which is left to their discretion, or other buildings identified by the county administration as being sensitive, which they can then have posted, but must be submitted to the board within the next 60 days um, for purposes of us of reviewing and approving or not approving that decision. So if Mr. Hendricks says the PDO is sensitive, he can order it to be posted, but he has to come back to us at a later date and say, I posted it and here's the reason why. Right, and that was, uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> uh, with the understanding, because I think we have, like Mr. Ekstrom is in this building along with some other attorneys, so if, uh, and I'm sure, County Attorney Matt Smith, I'm not all that fond of you to begin with, but I'm sure he'll keep his building uh, gun secured, but if he wanted it over here, then we'd have, it, st it still wouldn't mean because Matt Smith says he wants Bill Ekstrom protected that the whole thing is now, now just I, that office, that, that office. In my that. opinion and under the spirit of my motion, that would not occur because that, this building is under our control. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, Mr. Okay. Chairman, just to be consistent with uh, the wishes, what was astutely brought up with Supervisor Moss previously and by Supervisor Moss previously and to comply with the wishes of ASEP, uh, instead of allowing, could we change the language to not, prohib uh, to not, not prohibit. prohibit? Yes. I will again amend my motion to remove the words as to allowing and instead um, direct staff to remove languages in our, within our ordinance and policies prohibiting. Any further questions? I think the motion needs a second if it's going to oh, go anywhere. Oh, <laughs> second. I got all the rest of them. Might as well get that one, too. <laughs> Supervisor Johnson, second your motion. There's been a lot of discussion amongst the motion. Can I please have the motion restated altogether, please? I will give it a shot. <laughs> I hereby move um, that we omit from county ordinance and policy any reference to prohibiting of weapons in Mojave County buildings under the direct control of the Board of Supervisors, um, accepting from that that uh, independent elected officials may feel free to post in their independent judgment buildings which are under their exclusive control, and the county administration, the county administrator, may order a building posted if he feels it warranted for sensitive circumstances, subject to an obligation to bring that posting back to the board for purposes of um, review and approval or disapproval. And that um, prohibition will apply to both employees and to the public. The removal of any prohibition for weapons will apply to both employees and to the public. I uh, will second discussion. The only other question I would have, should we take the employees part out because we just removed it from their merit rules? Do we even need employees in it? Just the buildings are open? Which, whichever way. 
So should I say something else? Do you want me to reference rules in addition to the ordinance and policy? Because I will. <laughs> no, I, I was just curious because I know we removed the, right. the employee manual before, so I know there was a question about from it like ASAP. Do we just leave, leave the employees out and say our buildings are open now? We wouldn't have anything to do with the employees because we've already removed it from their merit rules. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Johnson, I think I understand Mr. Moss's motion is pretty clear. Okay. Sounds good. My second. Okay. Ms. Branch, are you clear? Okay. I'm going to ask for a roll call vote. <laughs> Any further questions or comments? There being none, those in favor? Mr. Branch. Supervisor Johnson. Yes. Supervisor Brotherton? Yes. Supervisor Moss? Yes. Supervisor Angus? Yes. Supervisor Chairman Watson? No. Thank you very much. Motion is passed. We move on now to item number 94. Discussion, possible action, <coughs> approval of a board resolution number. 2013-057, Opposing State of Nevada bill, Assembly Bills 166 and 167, and direct staff to distribute to the Governor of Nevada, Nevada's Transportation Committee, and the Nevada Department of Transportation as soon as possible. <coughs> Mr. This Chairman. This is brought to us by Supervisor Hildy Angus. Yes, uh, Supervisor Watson. A motion um, for uh, discussion? So I'll make a motion for discussion. Second. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, ready? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, look, this, this resolution is uh, the Nevada Assembly. It's, there's a bill going through it to enact fees on cars of people who work or employed doing business in the state of Nevada. Um, how we understand it is that if you work over there, somehow you're going to be uh, forced to pay some kind of registration fee on your car. Um, uh, in this area, in the Tri-City tri area, every, everyone I speak with is against it. Um, how it would affect my constituents, Bullhead City, um, the majority of people who live in Bullhead City are employed in the town of Laughlin, Nevada. And we have worked together for years and years to get the relationship we have. We see it sort of as a taxation without representation kind of issue. Um, and so um, we put together, I put together a resolution that I'm hoping this board will approve. And it reads like this. Uh, a resolution opposing the adoption of the State of Nevada Assembly Bills 166 and 167, which would impose registration fees on Arizona residents and business owners who commute to work or engage in the business in the State of Nevada. Whereas, over several decades, there has developed between Mojave County, Arizona, and Clark County, Nevada, a positive and productive synergy. And whereas the above captioned assembly bills introduced in the Nevada legislature appear to be punitive and would detract from the positive working relationship now existing between the two counties. And whereas, if enacted, the bills would have on, not only an adverse effect upon Clark and Mojave counties, but would also adversely impact other border communities in the state of Nevada, such as West Jackpot, Wendover, Lake Tahoe, Mesquite, as well as other border communities. And whereas the legislation is proposed and introduced would burden and impede interstate commerce, as well as impose upon residents of adjacent border communities, such as Bullhead City, Arizona, an unwanted financial burden. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Mojave County Board of Supervisors does hereby oppose Nevada Assembly Bills 166 and 167 for the reasons here and above stated and for the further reason that the proposed legislation is regressive and will stifle progress and harmony between the counties. Excellent. Okay. Well done. <laughs> so moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. If I may. Supervisor uh, Johnson. I, I talked to Supervisor Angus about this, and I, I tried to get a hold of the sponsor, someone in Carrillo, uh, to get why he was doing this, but he, he obviously didn't want to um, take the time to respond. Uh, the only, I, I, I will support this amendment, but I, the problem that will come up is, look, we just took over a fire department in the northern part of the county, 
and part of the complaints I heard up there was people from Nevada are coming over here and all these people are using our roads and we should be taxing them. So I think people need to understand it works both ways. So when people come back and say we need to be taxing the Nevada people that come up to the Grand Canyon and use ours, we're saying no, we don't want our people taxed there. So it, it does go both ways and that's all. Thank you for your comment, Supervisor Dunton. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor of the signal of the motion signify by saying yes. Aye. 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 And those opposed? Motion carried. Item number 95, discussion, possible action, uh, approve the special event permit issuance and authorize the public works director to issue a <coughs> permit to the city of Bullhead for the 2013 City River Regatta uh, upon the city fulfilling applicable Mojave County special events permits and requirements and plan to provide Mojave County Parks approximately $42,790 in revenue during the city's whole park rental of the Davis Camp from August 8th through August 10th, 2013, and establish the Davis Camp closure to annual pass holder access during the city's uh, whole park rental period. Motion for discussion. Motion to discuss. Second. <clears throat> Motion and a second. Um, okay, the Bullhead City River Regatta is soon going to become, if it's not already, the largest event in our Tri-City area. And in the several years before, there's been some conflict as to um, what kind of role the county would play in it vis-a-vis -vis the parks, our Davis camp. And there was a lot of dissension and argument and um, bad will in the past. So this year, I instructed the county to work with the county manager uh, of Bullhead City and I said, I, I want everyone to be happy. I want everyone to um, um, take part in the riches of this event, but I also want it to you know, be a joint effort. And I'm pleased to say that that occurred. Um, and what, you have, what we have in front of us is the agreement that the two, um, ca the county and the city worked out between them. I'm very happy that they did that, and I'm gonna ask that we go ahead and approve this. Motion? Why the question, I have a question. Who, who's handling the financials on this? Is, is Sean Blackburn here or somebody? Who's, uh, who's the? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Johnson, I'd like to get Steve Letowski Steve down Letowski. here. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Letowski. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Watson, Mr. Supervisor Chairman, Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, the agreement that uh, is before us is just for the rental. We're, we're not partners in this. We're not financially liable for anything, right? In, in terms of liability, uh, no. Uh, the uh, City of Bullhead City uh, will be planning and operating the event uh, in accordance with the planned special event policy uh, by which uh, staff will oversee and ensure that the appropriate uh, uh, permits and that are uh, secured, such as through the Arizona Department of Transportation, as well as the uh, uh, satisfying any requirements of our Mojave County Risk Manager. Okay. Um, the, the money that's coming in, the numbers I'm looking at, unless I'm missing it, instead of charging a flat fee, we, we go on a percentage now, or what is this? Um, Chairman Watson, Supervisor Johnson, very good question. Uh, this particular uh, 2013 Bullhead Regatta does depart from last year. Uh, in which the City of Bullhead City proposes to rent the entire Davis camp for a three-day period, August 8th through the 10th. Uh, the regatta day is Saturday the 10th. Um, what the city and the county has uh, uh, worked out is a uh, plan by which uh, the city, uh, through the county's reservation system, will be offering three-day lodging packages for all of our vacation homes, our RV slips, as well as some of our camping sites and the county will recover at our special event rate, the lodging costs for those rentals for the three-day package. We'll also uh, uh, obtain an additional $5. Um, the city will be charging uh, um, a, uh, a figure uh, slightly higher uh, than, the, uh, uh, than the special event rate for those lodging as the city will recover uh, some uh, fees as well. 
Um, the city will also uh, plan the park uh, up to um, 2,470 day use parking spaces, especially on Regatta Day, and the county will receive $5 for every space sold. I believe the, uh, uh, the, the rates would be uh, $20 per parking space, so the county receives $5 and, and the city 15 uh, Davis Camp will be one of two venues for the regatta, uh, for the regatta launchings. Uh, Community Park in Bullhead City is the other venue, but we do expect uh, uh, at least the city estimates that approximately 15,000 uh, persons will launch from uh, Davis Camp. What is our av average, what's our daily take-in on this weekend, on this three, usually three-day weekend? The, uh, uh, Typically, um, Mojave County, um, in, in reference to your question um, in terms of what our, our usual take uh, is on, on a normal summer uh, weekend day, I don't have those figures in front of me, but uh, uh, this event does promise to uh, uh, potentially sell out all of our lodging, uh, RV spaces and vacation homes at a special event rate, uh, significantly higher than our, uh, our usual daily rate. Um, we do uh, see uh, day users uh, come in on, uh, on, the, on the weekends uh, in which we would recover. Uh, and I believe just off the top of my head, it's about $10,000 uh, for day users on the weekend. Uh, we were asking the board here in consideration of this event that we would not be entertaining new day users coming into the park, that the uh, $42,790 for the three days uh, would uh, be our uh, uh, our anticipated revenue share from the city using the park, so it would be significantly higher than we would normally see with uh, with our normal weekend. But that's just day users in that one part of the park. We have a whole whole large park. You, I mean, I can't believe that you don't have. If you got into negotiations with the city or with anybody, you wouldn't say you want to rent our whole place. This is what we make on a three-day weekend. We make an average of X amount of dollars. So you're going to have to match that. So what you're saying, let's just without those figures, you're saying ten thousand a day. So that's thirty thousand dollars plus the rest of the park. Now we don't have anybody still in those homes that's running by the month. Um, actually, I, there is one thing to correct, and that the city does recognize that we do have uh, our volunteers uh, that do uh, uh, rent our long-term uh, RV spaces, and uh, they will provide for accommodations uh, for those persons that remain. Um, in their uh, in their facilities, and I should point out that we did present a comparison of side by side to the board. Um, the amount that uh, the revenue sharing plan uh, presents is forty two thousand seven hundred ninety dollars. Uh, if the city were assessed uh, fees to rent all of those group spaces as well as our uh, our lodging facilities, uh, the total is forty two thousand two hundred ninety dollars, so five hundred dollars less than what the city has proposed in the revenue sharing. Right. Um, Last year, what was the funds that we charged? Just a three-day weekend. Uh, eleven thousand seven hundred and some odd dollars. Yes, it was uh, just over eleven thousand dollars. That was just for the single day. That was for uh, that was for renting the park not only on Regatta Day, but uh, we also recovered uh, uh, some funds for the rental of the park uh, uh, at least two other days. I believe the day before and the day after, yeah. the Friday and Sunday. And we still had we still had we were still making we were making our own sales too, weren't we? For the park, it wasn't complete control of the park. Under that event, it was not complete control of the park, and that uh, uh, parks uh, did uh, uh, make uh, lodging available, and uh, we only charged though the uh, uh, the, the regular Five, daily yeah. rate, not the special event rate that we'll be recovering. Right. Um, is this guaranteed money? We are charging this. We are going to get this money up front, right? We're not betting on if they have a poor weekend, they get snowed out or anything else, we're getting our funds? Uh, Chairman Watson, Supervisor Johnson, uh, there is uh, not an upfront payment. Uh, what uh, this revenue sharing plan provides is that the county will receive uh, uh, its uh, uh, special event lodging rate if those lodging facilities are rented. Um, based on our experience and seeing past events at Davis Park, as this serves as a venue in previous occurrences, uh, we are fairly confident that these uh, lodging facilities, the vacation homes, are going to be very attractive to uh, the 15,000 plus that will be launching, uh, that they'll want to be right there at the park. Well, the county's history of putting on events over there, the, the only one I'm familiar with we put on before, when we lose money in that one? 
uh, Chairman Watson, Supervisor Johnson, uh, yes, there were payments in those instances made by the county. In this case, the county will not be making any payments uh, that uh, uh, we would only stand to gain revenues. And uh, uh, Bullhead City would be submitting uh, sufficient risk uh, liability insurance uh, protecting the county from any claims as well. So uh, there's, uh, uh, we do not stand to lose uh, money in this uh, and only stand to gain from uh, the uh, lodging as well as the parking on site. I, I guess with the board, my, my only thing is I, I believe that if we have a park and the city wants to rent that park, they rent the park. They take the, they make the money or they lose the money. You know, I think we have a guaranteed amount. If we're going to get rid of our park and shut it down for three days, we should have a guaranteed amount, not, not be betting on what the city does or doesn't, or any promoter for that. I'm not just picking on the city. But that's just mine. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Supervisor Mott. Um, to clarify, just to make sure I'm correct on this, because I'm looking at the supervisor's calendar for this year, it is a three day event, but it's not a federal three day holiday they're taking from us. It's just three days, they, it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's not attached to any federal holiday, so we're not losing any three day weekend revenue. Is that correct? Uh, Chairman Watson, Supervisor Moss, great question. No, this uh, is uh, August 8th through the 10th. Regatta Day is the 10th, and uh, it would not conflict with uh, the three uh, popular summer holidays that we uh, do very well, uh, Memorial Day, uh, 4th of July, and, uh, uh, and Labor Day. And I do want to point out for the board that uh, Mr. Ed Califamo uh, with uh, Bullhead City Parks is present in the audience, and Mr. Califamo has done a tremendous work uh, toward uh, planning the 2013 event. Uh, he was instrumental in planning and operating the uh, uh, 2012 event. And there's also a representative from Bullhead City Police Department here that could uh, speak on any uh, planning and or operations. Any further questions for Mr. Lutowski? Um, no, just one, one more time. How many parking spaces are you putting aside that we're gonna make $5 each out of? Um, Chairman Watson, Supervisor Angus, uh, Bullhead City, as part of their transportation and parking plan, uh, does anticipate to make available as much as 2,470 parking spaces and possibly 700 additional spaces. We're not counting the 700 as, uh, as, uh, as possible revenue, but uh, uh, the county uh, would receive $5 of that $20 parking charge on the Saturday. So the uh, city does estimate the county to receive $12,350 right. just from parking. Right. This, is a, this is a huge event, and um, it's only going to get bigger. And um, the, I, the city has seen it, um, even in my own personal life. I live in, a, in a, a condo that's sort of like a vacation rental, and it is the only event, not July 4th, not Memorial Day, that sells out a year in advance. So I, I don't think you're going to have any problem. And I thank the county and Bullhead City for working together um, so closely. And everyone benefits. Everyone will benefit from this event. People come back. People will end up buying homes here. They'll come back for vacations. They'll spend their dollars in restaurants and stores. And, and it can only bring us good things. So thank you. Mr. Chairman, I do have one other question. Provider Ma. The parking that we're discussing, the over 2,000 parking spots, are, there, are those on site with Davis Camp or are those off site? Uh, Supervisor Watson, um, Supervisor Moss, uh, those will be on site. Uh, that uh, Bullhead's uh, traffic and parking plan uh, would take uh, advantage of uh, vacant areas across Davis Camp. And I should point out that the Mojave County Parks has been tremendous over the last year. We've been uh, hard surfacing some of our vacant areas and strategic areas to make use of this particular, maximize uh, the potential to accommodate these very large events. So these would be on site. Okay. And does that, um, is the county managing or running those sites or is it purely city staff and personnel? Yes, um, Supervisor Moss, as part of uh, the rental of Davis uh, Camp, uh, the city would take the responsibility uh, through their forces as well as possibly contract help uh, to uh, operate uh, Davis Camp, the traffic, uh, the security uh, throughout that three-day period, the 8th through the 10th. So it would be the city's responsibility. And, and knowing Mr. Califamo now over the last couple of years, uh, he's well on his way to making that plan happen. Thank you. Job well done, Mr. Lutowski. Thank you very much. I move to approve the special event permit issuance. Second. I have a motion to second for the approval of the special event. Item number 95. 
Any further questions? Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion to carry. Item number 96. This is a discussion of possible action, implementation of time clocks and or timekeeping systems for county employees to ensure compliance with wage and our relations. This is brought to us by Supervisor Buster Johnson. Motion to discuss. Second the motion. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Mr. Chairman, That's I brought great. this forward. Um, it has cost saving uh, to the county. It has keep us in, client, in compliance with uh, labor relations. I believe it will also help protect employees who are, who could be uh, forced to work time that are uncompensated for. And I put this on hopefully with the idea that we would give it back to staff to come back with a recommendation. Other counties have started using similar programs and I think uh, they could give us a legal opinion, a cost saving opinion uh, and then bring that back to us. Thank you, Supervisor Johnson. I had all the backup there. I didn't want to read it to you again. I'm sure you <laughs> Right. I have one person that would like to speak to this item, and that is uh, Cindy Cox. Tall people. <laughs> Chairman Watson, supervisors, and board. I just had a couple of things that I wanted to bring up, and I had to pick whether I was opposed or, or um, in favor of this item. I just wanted to make sure that there was a couple of things that I thought of when I was reading this that are taken into consideration. First of all, um, the elimination of the 65 hours uh, per pay period that the finance department spends, I believe is not going to be an elimination, it's going to be a transfer because each department, based on my history with um, Kronos, in other companies and timekeeping devices, even when they're very automated, um, you have to have an editor in each department. So now you'll have an editor in every department, um, and generally that editor has to be a supervisor or higher. So we're talking about people at higher levels, possibly a director. I know that when I worked at the hospital, the director of finance and accounting was the editor for this, someone who can go in and say, oh, I've lost my badge, can you clock me in? Oh, I've forgotten to clock in, can you clock me in? Those kind of things. If you're off site, same kind of thing. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily come to this building before they do other things to come to the building, so the, that editor handles that. Um, Call-ins, sick, that kind of thing. Um, the editor will spend a minimum of five to 15 minutes per day with an average staff such as mine with 20, uh, 19 people. Um, and then about 20 minutes per pay period, uh, depending on the number of employees in each department. And again, the editor will have to be at a higher level, so they'll be paid at a higher level generally than the staff that works doing payroll now. Um, the cashiers in the treasurer's office are required by Arizona Revised Statutes to be at the window by 8 o'clock. So if they have to clock in, are we now having to pay them overtime? They also have to, they, they are required to be sitting there until 5 o'clock. So now are we going to pay them overtime? This is, these are some of the questions that come up when I see this. Um, and the merit rules, I imagine, will have to be adjusted um, for early or late clock check-in or check-out. Um, is Will there be a penalty? How many times do you get to do it? How many times can you lose your badge? How many, you know, that, your, your clock-in uh, stuff? And um, will employees clock in when they come, clock in and out for their break, clock in and out for their lunch, clock in and out for their break, and clock out? That's eight punches per day. And generally you see lines of people sitting around the time clock waiting for the right time to hit so they can clock out, and that means they're not working. And I, this is not something that I necessarily would want in my office. So, just wanted to say that. And Mr. Chairman, I have some questions if I may. I, <coughs> Certainly. You bring up some good points that I hope they will, it'll be looked at. I don't believe that what anybody has is a, I think the time clocks or the, 
kind of old school now, it's all done from their individual computers so that people wouldn't have to do it. If there are people in Mojave County who are required to be, um, I mean, I require my people to be at, at their seats at 8 o'clock and not to move until 5 o'clock, um, excuse me, but they have to be compensated. Now, obviously, my people aren't because that's where their duty station is at. I guess that's up to the treasurer to make sure that they have th those uh, things accounted for because uh, we get a lot of precedent set by California, and California has had, um, familiar with deputy sheriffs who got to work 15 minutes early for a briefing. They retroactively sued and got millions and millions of dollars from different counties statewide. I mean, guys who were dog handlers um, sued because they had to take care of dogs for all those years and, and got millions of dollars. Uh, part of the region is one of the counties that I talked to was the court system where uh, court clerks were being required by their judges to uh, they would hand them stuff during their lunch hour and say, can you get this done? And they were, and, and obviously they would do it, that's, that's what they do, but the person in charge said, I will fire you if you continue to do that because those people can come back next year or two years down the road. So it protects us from, and it protects the employees so they, they get it in. So I, I think it could be a benefit to all of us and hopefully all those questions have been answered previously by the other ones that have done it. That's all I have, Mr. Thank you, Supervisor John, and thank you, Ms. Cox. Thank you. Is it my understanding then, Supervisor Johnson, that you were going to recommend this back to staff? The, my, the motion I would be to recommend this to go to uh, staff and have um, county administrator and office of budget management and attorneys look at it and bring something back, evaluate it. Okay. If I may, Mr. Chairman, when it goes to staff, can we have an estimate as to the costs of installation and maintenance? Also, right. again, I'm looking at that cost-benefit thing. Yeah. Okay. And that would be part of the motion. We have a motion. Second. And a second. <coughs> Any further questions? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed? Motion carried. Item number 97. By the way. Chairman, I place this on the agenda. Make a motion for discussion. All right. And I'll second the motion. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Supervisor Johnson. I place this on the agenda. I have, there's some people here I believe that are probably signed up for it. Uh, I'll let them plead their case in front of your okay. board. Okay. Uh, Catherine Covert. I'll do it once. That's all. Tony and Mary Van Roy. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Watson and Supervisors. If you'll state your name and my name's address for the record. My name's Mary Van Roy, 4034 Blue Canyon Road, Lake Havasu City, Arizona, 86406. My name is the same, same address, 4234. Um, Tony. <laughs> um, first, I, I'm very excited to be able to come forward and ask for this um, recreational trail because it's been a dream for a long time. And this is our best opportunity to have it happen. And I want to thank the supervisors for our detention basins that have been built already. And now the, the contract has been let and they've started construction on the flood control project. And this does definitely improve our community and improve the values of our property. Uh, Tony and I built our home in ha Horizon 6, but we call it Donkey Acres. And that's what we all know it by, so I'm going to use that. Uh, 20 years ago, we built there because we wanted to have horses in our backyard. And we have enjoyed having our horses for 20 years, and we very much enjoy riding out into the desert, the state lands, the public lands. And um, we do take our horses back to the a ranch where they work all summer at a dude ranch in Greenlee County, up by Big Lake area in the White Mountains. Uh, the proposed trail would allow so much safer travels for us on horseback, and it also would be a great recreational trail for hikers. Um, people are always going up and down our street, but we don't have any sidewalks, we're very rural. So it's very, unpleasant and um, not really safe to be going up and down. 
people could walk their dog on this trail, they, kids could ride their bikes on the trail, um, get through the community, and we're one mile roads, five of them. And we have talked about the safety issues, which are very, very important to protect the channel, and they're thinking that maybe we can use a two, a two cable system um, along the trail or a two pipe system so that horses would stay within a designated area, the hikers and the bikers, so nobody would be just traveling all over the neighborhood. Um, Tony and I and many of the people that are here today have worked a lot with BLM to GPS trails um, for their master plan and we've done this all around Horizon, well around Donkey Acres and we're also very involved with Lake Havasu City on trails and they're very supportive of recreational trails. This is the best opportunity we've ever had to get this trail done. Um, Thursday I was at the feed store and she started a petition Thursday because so many people could not make this meeting. They can't drive up from Havasu, they're working. When you have horses it's very expensive so uh, most of them are working people. And we have over 50 signatures that I'd like to share. And another thing we did, or I did, was drive up and down our five streets and on each street I put down an address number of someone who has horses in their backyard or, oh it tells me I'm almost. <laughs> And some pictures of our, we sold an acre to the flood plan, and so I, I have some pictures here that I'd like to share. And I have more things, but I will let somebody else have a turn since my Thank time you. is up. Do I leave these here, and do they come up to you, or do you want them? Uh, why don't you bring them up here, and I'll okay. circulate them up here. Thank you very much. Jane Riley. Good afternoon. My name is Jane Riley, and I live at 3620 Lake Havasu Ave, or Vega Drive in Lake Havasu. And I've lived in Lake Havasu for 12 years now, have been coming to the city for since 1985. I come from the East Coast, if you can't tell from my accent. I grew up in northern Massachusetts and New Hampshire, and I guess this trail that's going through in Donkey Acres, as Mary has said, will go f access from one side of the area to the other, and it will provide safe access across the whole area for not only hikers, because I also hike, I also have a horse, and I watched in New England how all the open areas have been swallowed up by housing developments. There's really no, they've started putting in greenways, but you're talking an area that's been habitated for, what, 400 years. So now even when I go back to the East Coast and enjoy riding there, we have to trailer our horses to go anywhere that's non-motorized and safe to ride the horses. Because on the streets, it's very narrow, and when I used to have a horse up there, it was at least a mile or more just to get to a trail. In Donkey Acres, yes, the streets are a mile long. To go from one side to the other, which we access trails on both sides, it's almost a mile to go that distance as well. So we would be relegated to riding up and down the streets as well as hikers and people walking their dogs and everything else just to access the open areas. So it's, I just wanted to bring that forward that I would like to see Lake Havasu and the surrounding area be progressive and avoid some of the situations that are happening in other parts of the country as far as open areas and access to them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jane. Julie Mendez. Hi, Chairman Watson and Board Supervisors. Um, I live out there in Donkey Acres also on Window Rock. My name, um, my address is 4052 Window Rock and uh, I would really like to see you approve this, um, this writing area where we could just access back and forth. Um, I, I also ride and, and to get 
behind to the people behind me. I'm pretty. I'm like a mile up Window Rock, so for me to get to the properties behind me would be just nice if we could just go down that trail that's going to be open land anyway that's not being used. It would just be awesome to have a little trail we could safely go on without worrying about going through people's properties who don't want horses, you know, going through their properties. And, and I have a grandson that's nine, and he likes to ride his bike around there, and I would feel great if he had a trail that I know would be safe for him to go on to get to maybe a friend's house that lived two streets over. And because I couldn't let him just go all the way down our street, go across Lake Lakeside and then back up, you know, that way it's just too far and not safe because there's too many people that drive fast down our roads sometimes just because they like the hills. It's kind of like a joy, joy ride, especially on my road. There's like this big hill at the top past my house that people like go up there just to go down and they're all, yeah, you know, and it's like, oh, I wish we, you know, I mean, that's just, you know, the kid in us wanting to have fun. But, you know, when you got little kids out there playing and dogs, you don't want to have them out there on that road when you never know who's going to come zooming by. So um, anyway, if, oh, I have a picture. I went online. I got a picture of a type of a gate that you could put up that would, at the end of each road that would prevent um, motorized vehicles from using this trail, but it would allow horses or walkers to get through. And I didn't know if you ever saw one, so I printed up a picture of, of this type of a horse fence. There's two of them here, two different types. And so you want me to bring that up? Sure. Okay. I'll make you trade if you'll give me those. And give these back to the other lady. How's that? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ruth Foster. Good afternoon. My name is Ruth Foster. I reside at 4031 Lakeview Road in Lake Havasu, or Donkey Acres. Um, I've been a property owner in Donkey Acres for the last 17 years, and when I bought my property, we still had dirt roads. Um, our roads have since been paved, and as been previously discussed, there's lots of hills, lots of speeders. Um, I would not allow my grandchildren to ride their bikes on that street because there's too many blind spots, just, just not good visibility, and it's not safe. Um, I also own horses and horseback ride, and we are pretty much at the mercy of property owners to allow us to pass through their property to get to the desert, and there are less and less property owners willing to take that risk, and they don't want the motorcycles going through the washes that are on their property, so that also they will block their washes, and that blocks us access to the desert, which means we are also riding on paved roads or going long distances to get to the desert, and that also horses on pavement is very unsafe. So I totally support this, and the road that has been placed because of this project is perfect for access for all of, our, all of us to use, for our children to use, and um, it would be a really great thing. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Gina Lander. I'm Gina Lander, and I have property at 4011 Gold Springs Road. Um, the problem I see with not doing this project is the topography of the roads there are so bad that today, if I was wanting to pave them and you develop it, you would not approve the roads because they are so steep that you can't even see over the hood of your car like 10 feet. I mean, it's... It's blind for a lot of these vehicles going over the hill. The other thing is what's happened, because it's not flat land, you know, a lot of the property is above the road. So as people have built houses, they have pushed their property dirt basically onto the roadway. Because isn't the roadway 30 feet? Do you know Mike Hendricks? So if it's 30 feet, there's, what is it, 24 feet of pavement? 
people have pushed their property onto the dirt, which is still county road. So there's no place to like walk even on some of the pavement area or the roadway because people have, it's not even legal. I mean, it's not their property to push dirt onto that area. So the county really should go in there and clean up that so the horses don't have to be on that pavement. Um, the other thing, 10 years ago, I was out there riding my horse with another friend. And there was an off-road vehicle coming out from the desert and came around the corner onto the pavement and hit my friend on her horse. The girl was okay on the horse. The horse did not survive. I almost was taken out. I think what happened is the vehicle didn't have proper brakes. So when the guy broke, put on his brakes, it turned his car into me but I was okay. So that's an example where you're gonna have some people killed out there, and then they are going too fast. So yes, the roads are one mile long, but it's not flat land where you can see, and the dirt that people should be able to walk on is not there because people have pushed their property onto the dirt. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Colbert. Hi, Chairman and Supervisors. I'm Catherine Colbert, 4060 Lakeview Road, Lake Havasu City, Arizona. I've lived in Havasu since 93. We've been coming here since the 80s. Um, Donkey Acres is an area that is very limited equestrian area. There's not much left in Lake Havasu. And I really hate to see us get landlocked. And I see that, and that's why I let everybody else talk first, because they kind of explain what's going on. And I think that the Mockingbird wash system that I've seen is monstrous. And the least that they could do would be to leave a multi-use path for a lot of different you know, entities, such as equestrians, bicycles, and hiking and make safe passage from one end of the development all the way to the other and let us just have access. It would be very nice. The only other thing I've seen in, in Donkey Acres that I don't agree with is on the um, eminent domain type thing with the utility poles. People, as Gina said, they are taking their fencing from their property lines and attaching it to the utility poles, which allowed us access. And so anyway, I don't think that that's right. It, we should still be allowed access to use those right-of-ways. And I support um, this whole project as long as we can all work together and make it work for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Anyone else wishing to speak to this item? Supervisor Brotherton. Okay, uh, Mr. Hunt, have you done um, an evaluation of the site? Uh, have you done any work out there? I'd like to have your opinion. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Brotherton. I uh, appreciate your question, and uh, I like to ask you to please, please allow me to give you a historic background and. Uh, explain the limitations and the design of this uh, channel uh, because it's not really a dirt channel. So if you allow me, I, I'll just go through really quick uh, what the limitations were and, uh, and so give you an idea. The, uh, as you know, the uh, Horizon 6 subdivision is bisected by a drainage course, a uh, mockingbird wash. And that uh, drainage course uh, doesn't have a defined channel for most part, but it, uh, some areas it was just sheet flow or just spreading around and there is no right of way uh, for the channel. So, but uh, it, there were major floods and then there was a lot of sediment, uh, sediment problems and, uh, and flooding and uh, so to correct the problem, um, we uh, designed a, a channel there. Now to put in a, a new channel, 
we uh, had to purchase property. And uh, so we picked the, uh, one of the historic floors and purchased properties. And, and uh, one of the major costs for this project was the property purchase. And to minimize the, the uh, cost, we uh, tried to fit in the channel into uh, basically a column of one acre uh, parcels. And I, I hope uh, IT can bring up a map that I uh, gave it to them so I, I could explain it. Um, as you can see on that, uh, on that map, uh, the proposed channel is uh, fit into uh, a row of uh, one acre uh, parcels. So that pretty much limits the width of the channel, which is roughly 145 feet. So we evaluated you know, how much water the channel has to carry, and to fit it into the 145 feet, uh, because of the uh, space limitations, we had to design it with uh, steep slopes, steep side slopes. And when I mean steep, uh, the side slopes vary somewhere between uh, 3 to 1 horizontal to vertical to 1 to 1 horizontal to vertical. So uh, 1 to 1 horizontal to vertical, that's like 45 degrees. And to give you an idea what is 1 to 1, uh, a person will not be able to walk up and down. In fact, a, w a person would be unable to get down on the knees and hands and knees and climb up and down. So it's that steep. So this is what we had to do to design it. Now, an, an earth slope would not stand at this uh, steep uh, inclination. So uh, to make it a stable uh, slope and, and also to accommodate the uh, flows, we had to design it with uh, soil cement lining. So this whole channel project is designed with soil cement lining. And uh, another question is what is soil cement? And uh, soil cement is um, basically when you mix uh, cement into the native soils instead of bringing it in import aggregate. And, uh, but for a person walking by for all practical, all practical purposes, a soil cement looks like, feels like, just like hard cement concrete. So this channel will, the appear, will have the appearance of uh, hard concrete. And uh, in addition to that, the, uh, because of the geometry, uh, and uh, Nathan brought up the uh, cross sections, we um, had to incorporate in the design uh, so-called drop structures. So the drop stu structures basically slow down the flow. And these are three foot high vertical drops in the channel bottom as you go along. So adding all that up, having the steep slopes, uh, concrete slopes basically, and the drop structures down at the bottom, uh, this channel was no way designed for, uh, for let anybody enter the, inside the channel. So, Having that on the table, the only option would be to accommodate what the folks are asking is to have access and, and put up a trail on the uh, channel banks uh, up on the top. And uh, if Nathan can bring back the other uh, map, uh, that would uh, put a, uh, a, a line where it's possible, uh, put in a, a blue line along, it would have to kind of uh, uh, go along the channel and go from one side to the other, that's the only room we have. And then you can ask, why don't we have more room? Again, because we limited the, the number of properties that we purchased. And uh, so according to this map, uh, between uh, Blue Canyon and Gold Springs, we have about 12 to 16 feet left that, that would be available for a trail. But uh, between Gold Springs and Lake View, we have only like seven and a half, eight feet left for a trail, so it's very narrow. And uh, the other, the other ends, uh, we would probably have enough. We would have 12 to 18, or or more feet left. But um, I also like to add that um, so when we have this very narrow trail possibility, say seven and a half, eight feet, we would have to accommodate also uh, fences uh, on one side, on the channel side. Of course, we need a fence to uh, 
keep people falling into the channel and you know, getting hurt on these steep slopes. And then in addition to that, on the channel slabs, we would need some kind of safety railing uh, that, uh, that would keep people, especially horse riders. And on the, on the other side, not the channel side, but on the other side, we would have to protect people's property rights, so they would, would to have, a, have to put a fence there too. So uh, these are the limitations. Now, I, I just want to add that uh, the construction just started, and uh, they haven't really broken ground. They, they mobilizing the equipment, but the construction is underway. This uh, project has been approved by the board. It was approved in, in April. And uh, considering this uh, narrow possibility for the trail, I, um, I talked with the risk manager. You know, I'm an engineer, but uh, I, I asked him to look at it, uh, what uh, would be the uh, concerns for a safety concern for a narrow trail for horse riders and, uh, and potentially ATVs or whatever it's used for. So if you don't mind, I wanted to ask uh, Bob Prince, our, our uh, risk manager, to address the uh, safety issues for a narrow trail. Would that be possible? Thank you. Mr. Andrews, <clears throat> at the pleasure of the board, I'd like to ask Bob to come down. Please. <clears throat> yeah, I'll be all right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Watson, members of the board, um, county man or county administrator. Um, Nick did ask me to take a look at this, and I have looked at his engineering plans along with the over um, site map that was available on the viewer just a few minutes ago. From a risk management perspective, several um, challenges come forward, and I think that the young lady that spoke earlier um, brought up the key challenge, and that is the property owners in and around this wash that's being um, constructed and the drainage that's being constructed, they themselves, as she said, do not want to accept the risk of having um, uh, the horses um, and um, other types of um, transportation on their property. And I think that's the same question that we would be asking. Why would we accept it? When I look at the um, map that Nick provided me, I have some great concern that the trail narrows down to only seven feet, six inches wide. Um, from my experience, that's much too narrow for uh, conf um, conflict of traffic between um, perhaps even two horses passing in opposite directions. Um, it also creates what I tend to believe will be an attractive nuisance on the county's part um, in that we will um, create what is um, a haven, if you will, for motorized vehicles will be re required to um, limit access for those motor motorized vehicles. Um, that's going to be an extended cost to us. The other thing that's going to happen is we're going to have to enforce that uh, motor motorized vehicle prohibition. And so that's going to take Sheriff's Department um, resources um, for which to do that. Um, So my recommendation to this board is that um, we not create an attractive nuisance and not accept this risk for Mojave County. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question? Supervisor Mullen. My understanding is what's pending before the board is for non-motorized vehicles, not motorized vehicles. We're talking bicyclists, pedestrians, and I believe horses. That's correct. Um, so how do we get an ATV out there? I mean. Because I've seen some of the pictures that have flowed by, and I've seen what the county has done in um, in Fort Mojave with what seems like to be very similar with this, and it looks like it's they have it's very easy for them to limit access to by motorized vehicles and these small little V gates, which wouldn't let an ATV through, but would certainly let a person or a bicyclist or a horse through, um, solves the problem. Um, Supervisor Moss. Um Chairman Watson, I, I agree with you, except that 
Um, in a lot of instances, what we have is um, without great um, effort, um, limiting of motorized vehicles will be very difficult um, because we have even some of the smaller motorized vehicles today, mm -hmm. um, scooters, uh, small motorcycles um, that are there. And in doing so, one of my fears is that we create an attractive nuisance um, into the actual concrete wash um, with three and four foot drop offs um, where we know for a fact that testosterone will warrant um, and will rule um, the uh, motorized vehicles and even non-motorized vehicles such as um, skateboards and scooters to attempt to make additional jumps off of those uh, elevated areas. Well, um, my interest, I mean, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to picture these designs in my mind, but we're going to have tons of attractive nuisances in that channel. Um, I saw what we put, and it was a beautiful job, by the way. If I was 12 years old, I'd be out there with my skateboard. Um, it's, it's, but, but whether you allow me out there or not, I'm going to be out there with my skateboard. Mm -hmm. And that's my understanding of the law of attractive nuisance, and Mr. Ekstrom can um, correct me where I'm wrong. But it's, it doesn't matter whether you allow it, it's whether it exists because it's for keeping or protecting minors. So whether you intended to allow access or not has nothing to do with it. If they get access and they die, you're on, you're on the hook. <laughs> I mean, we, And we will. Yeah, all right. You're correct. Um, but the difference is that if we attempt to uh, prohibit them, then the majority of them will be uh, limited from entering the access and entering the wash to do that kind of activity. Oh, I thought we were talking about testosterone-filled 12 and 13-year-olds. Your sign we, doesn't mean we, nothing. <laughs> well, some of them are testosterone-filled 30-year-olds. <laughs> That's that is true. <laughs> um, Supervisor Andy, what, what is the added cost to this? What is? I don't have those numbers. <laughs> Any other questions for me or? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Angus, the added cost, I, I looked at the added cost uh, uh, for fencing. It's, it's a little more than half a mile. So, you know, the added cost would be another extra fence all along and then some safety railing. So it, it would be on the range of uh, hundred to $200,000 extra right. cost. Hundred to 200000 And how about maintaining it? Uh, well, maintenance will be minimal. Maintenance will be minimal. Uh, uh, you know the the channel maintenance is minimal as it as it is because it's soil cement and then the uh, the fences would be would require minimal maintenance. I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Johnson, when you when you're looking at the fence, what type of fence were you looking at putting between the flood control project and the private property? That, that concerns me because people have asked me, you know, if, if something like this happens, then you're opening up a lot of their property to besides riders and hikers, burglars and thieves. And so, right. <laughs> you know, just the, the view or before they have property where at least only in the front part of the, you could drive by and look in and see what they have. Now they can go down the side and look, are we looking at building a six foot, seven foot block wall or what are we gonna do for their protection? No, uh, the, the, uh, the answers that I gave to uh, Supervisor Angus on the cost uh, would uh, assume Either, either a, uh, a cable, just cables, or, or chain link fences. Now, if we want to do something more expensive, you know, we could do it. It's always a question of money. I, I guess that would come in, and maybe Mr. Ekstrom would, would want to answer, but would that go under the taking? I mean, where we've, we had that new law about if we change somebody's property values, where, you know, all of a sudden you just have, these are one acre lots, and obviously they're longer than they are wide in the front, so somebody could just drive up in front, now they can drive up in front and then walk down the side or whatever. Would somebody have a case for possibly changing their value of their property? Or? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Johnson, I don't believe so. I, I do have a question, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Supervisor Ma. This is, we're talking about essentially half a half mile worth of trail, is that correct? Yes, it's, it would be just about half a mile, a little more than half a mile. How much would it can cost to construct a half mile of trail? Well, basically, uh, 
the only cost is the fencing. That's, that's what we're talking about. Well, I mean, let's see, we have a smooth flat surface for a half mile, which we're going to build as part of this system, this channel system. Right. Um, and if we were to take and wanted to use, for a divorce from this channel system, and wanted to substitute a half mile of trail someplace else, how much would that cost to make it a smooth, flat, comparable surface that people could use for their bicycles and their skateboards or whatever? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Supervisor Moss. Uh, the, um, to, to construct uh, another location would uh, require property again. Uh, right now, the way I understand it is a, uh, a channel right away available, little finger wash that's available, that's dirt, and um, uh, that would, could provide access out to the mountains and um, you know, upgrade that. But uh, the, my understanding is that uh, the city maintains that uh, channel, it's not the county. And what I'm getting at is the opportunity cost. For the cost of fencing, we get a half mile of trail which is a public amenity and would, I think, increase the value in the neighborhood and it allow people to do things in a safe fashion as opposed to, you know, I don't like it when my kids play in the street on their bicycles, they do it, but this would be a place which is, they could drive for a half a mile and not be worried about being run over by a car. Um, so what's the opportunity cost? And it seems like the opportunity cost is fencing, which means it's cost advantageous to do it here as opposed to somewhere else. That, that, that is correct. Here, the only cost would be the fencing. Uh, again, uh, the limitations are, especially in the middle section, the, uh, the width, the relative width, yes. But six feet is, or seven feet and six inches is wider than your traditional sidewalk, which I think is what, roughly three feet, something like that? That is correct, yes. On a sidewalk. What's that? <laughs> you don't normally ride a horse on a sidewalk. I don't ride horses at all. <laughs> I haven't been on a bicycle in decades, but <laughs> I have nothing else, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. you, Supervisor Moore. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Chair, would entertain a motion. I move that we approve um, utilizing the Horizon 6 channel for non motorized recreational vehicles and instruct staff to plan accordingly. We have a motion. <clears throat> I'll second your motion. Discussion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I guess m my discussion would be that um, where is this money coming from? We don't uh, take flood control money to make trails with. Uh, we have to we have to figure out that money. I, th I think if the idea of trails, uh, while we're all, I believe, in support of it, the, the county does that through the Parks Department, I believe, is where our, our trail system comes in at. Um, the other problem that I have is opening this up, there's also been requests from um, Horizon 6, Donkey Acres, uh, has a tremendous amount of motorcycle people, too, who are uh, curious as to why we would build something that they don't have access to, and then the Jeep people. and the, uh, with liability issues. I, I would like to see more trails and that stuff issued, but I don't think that it's uh, flood control money should be the way it's going. Mm -hmm. that's, just, that's just my opinion. Well, you might be the closest one to it. <laughs> <laughs> Your opinion might be very well worth it. If I can ask a question, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Hendricks, uh, was my motion sufficiently broad that when it comes to funding sources and things of that nature, when it comes to take, have staff take a appropriate action, you could bring a funding source back to us at our next meeting, if it was a pleasure of the board. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Moss, I, I believe it was. I, I'd like to add, if uh, I may, uh, one of the things we're going through the budget process currently, um, we're trying to hang on to a balanced budget for general fund. So, um, you know, $200,000 is a significant amount. With that said, flood control funds could certainly be used for a, a trail, but that's not what they were they were collected for. But legally, I believe they could be used to augment that channel. Um, uh, parks, parks has already taken a two hundred fifty thousand dollar hit plus plus another fifty thousand dollar hit. Uh, they 
in my opinion, they can't stand another hit, uh, especially in the range of $200,000. That would almost bankrupt our park and defeat the purposes that we've uh, established an enterprise fund for. Um, uh, other than that, trying to identify additional funds, you know, it, it gets slim. One of the things that I like to promote, um, if uh, a project wasn't designed for a specific multi-use purpose, and this one wasn't, uh, and the reason it wasn't is because what we tried to do is minimize the impact to the residents in that area. We had people that didn't want to give up their property, so we even went so far as building a retention basin to limit the footprint of that channel up there and not take another row of properties, which would have increased the cost, and I think it was a tremendous decision to, to do that and to move in that direction. So. Uh, 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 to try to make this a multi-use facility might be a force. Um, you know, what I, I, I like to see are the partnerships to where uh, uh, if we did make land available that the people would come up in, with the funding themselves uh, for their use. I do agree with it's, it's hard to pick and choose who we're going to ben benefit with public funds. If we were looking for, for a, uh, and, and I appreciate you letting me talk, uh, if we were looking for a, a uh, an expenditure of public funds for a, a trail, you know, it's hard to choose the winners and losers and decide who gets to use it and who, who's not. I'm not a horse person. I know if I was a, I'm not a motorcycle person either. Um, I'm more of a foot person, but uh, I would be hard pressed to come before the board and say, I want this trail to only be utilized by foot traffic, you know, and then cut out the rest of the uses. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrew. Any further questions or discussion? Okay. We certainly have a motion for the approval. In a second. Any further discussion? There being none. Those in favor of this motion signify by saying aye. Aye. And those opposed? Nay. Nay. It has been defeated. Item number 98. Discussion and possible action approval of a request to Mayview community representatives to utilize a 150 foot wide drainage easement and public Another utility trip. easement as a fitness as a fitness trail <coughs> for the community on the top right hand bank along with the existing ephemeral, ephemeral wash for the stated purpose I'll make a motion for discussion Second. Second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Um, Supervisor Brotherton, this is your yes. district. This is um, a great place for a trail. And the people in Meadview have always been very proactive in all that they did. And I thought this was a great idea since you started it, Steve, with your parks thing there. Uh, the community came together with some money. Well, Meadview already has a lot of donations toward this. It's not going to cost the county anything. They're going to, um, it's, a, it's a nice trail. And uh, I believe Ted Roper and Mr. Haunt have some pictures of how they uh, cleaned this wash out. Uh, actually, it's called a channel rather than a wash, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the people of Meadview are all set to go. They would like to have maybe some concrete picnic tables periodically along. It's like 35, 40 feet across. I walked the whole thing back and forth, nice level ground there's really not much to do it's it's just really nice so uh, Mr. Hahn or Ted Roper you guys have your pictures and your uh, information there John it's not going to cost anything Mr. Chairman <coughs> Supervisor Brotherton thank you for the opportunity um, basically this is a, uh, a drainage easement and it's 150 feet wide and uh, it um, it has a, uh, a, a channel in the middle which doesn't flow only when it, when it rains really heavily. And uh, so uh, this is dirt and currently has three to one slopes. Three to one slopes again is something that you can easily walk up and down. Anybody can walk up and down, no problem. And it's dirt. And uh, this uh, was just a, a wash that uh, 
as part of our maintenance program to protect the uh, property. Uh, we fixed up the slopes and established the uh, bank and then the folks in, in mid US. And it, there's already access to it. There is nothing restricting folks uh, going in there. They want to make it uh, a little nicer, and we intend to maintain it. And Ted Roper is the one who worked on the uh, establishing the uh, maintenance on it. And uh, if you would allow me, I would like to ask uh, him to say a few words on it. Certainly. Thank you. Mr. Roper. Mr. Chairman, Board of Supervisors. Oh. My name is Ted Roper. I'm the drainage maintenance supervisor for the Flood Control District. In September 2010, Meadview received a large thunderstorm which caused a flash flood in that area. This specific channel we're talking about, the uh, side channel, the side, the side of the channel was breached and water overtopped it and left its normal path, went across private property, uh, Mojave County roads, and went through one particular house right between the house and the garage. Uh, fortunately, the house was, did not receive any damage, but uh, there was minor damage to the garage. Upon my arrival and looked at this area, we found that, 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 that this was a dedicated easement to the public uh, parcel. Uh, we uh, immediately put a game plan together and went in and repaired this channel. Uh, we repaired half of the channel because the first part of the upper part of the channel was still pretty good. Uh, the next year we went in and re did the upper part of the channel. This is a 150 foot wide channel, all made of local dirt. Um, it is three to one to five to one slopes, very easily accessible. You can walk on it anywhere you want. There's no, uh, there's no uh, fences here. Matter of fact, the people of, of uh, Meadview are now using this. They're walking up and down it. They came to us and asked if they could use this. They came to us and said, hey, we have an idea. We want a walking we want to put a walking trail out. We want to put a few little uh, exercise pull-up bars, some picnic tables, some things like that. They're not going to construct any kind of con uh, sidewalk. It's going to be made out of the natural dirt. All of these things they want to do are going to be a minimum of five foot above where the channel runs now. I see no problem with them putting this in. It, it's not going to impede or affect the flow of water down that channel. Now they, they brought us a plan here. Um, we've been out there. They have raised money to buy all of this, and they're willing to do all the work themselves. Uh, is there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Roper. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hendrick. Uh, the way I would, uh, a couple questions I would ask is that they're not intending, you know, it's our channel, they're not intending to re restrict the use in any way to other individuals and that this is safe. And I believe we've taken a look at it and that uh, there's plenty of room out there for them to accomplish the, the traffic that was needed. Yes, sir, plenty of room on top. And that uh, this would be at no cost to the county, that the maintenance of the structures would be uh, the responsibility of the people who installed them? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, and that I believe uh, if the board chose to, chose to approve this, that it would be done more along the lines of a, a through a right-of-way use permit, a use agreement, use agreement. and, uh, and uh, that a similar activity. Thank you. Okay. Um, I move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second for the approval of item number 98, and that is the, uh, for the Meadview Community Footpath. Any further discussion? There being none, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carried. Item number 99, discussion, possible action, status of drafting, distributing, gathering, completed conflict of interest forms uh, from county employees. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, if I Reservoir. may, um, I'd like to make a motion to continue this to the May 20th meeting for two reasons. One, time interest, I see we have some items that you're going to take some time and we're already in mid-afternoon. Secondly, I want to discuss with Mr. Ekstrom before the next meeting um, one of the um, changes that was made and discuss that with him. Continue till May 20? May second. 20th. We have a motion and a second to continue till May 20. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Item 100. Discussion, possible action, 
uh, compliance with minutes, recordings, and warrant requirements of ARS 11-217, continued by the board from the April 1 meeting. Um, I would be making the same motion on item 100 to continue it to the May 20th meeting. Continue to May 20th. Second. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carried. Item 101, discussion, possible action, uh, approving the changing of the classification of office and management budget matters position from classified to unclassified. That's been continued from the board uh, from the April 1, 2013 meeting. This isn't one I want to continue. <laughs> I was making a joke. We should handle it now. <laughs> okay. Uh, motion for discussion. Second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Mr. Moss? Do we need a motion Mark. to go into executive session? I see this is a double start item. I think he asked that this be done in open session. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding that the personnel matter was to have been done in open session. Oh, okay. That's what he asked. Yeah. It's been requested that it be done in open session. I do have a person who would like to speak to this item. And that is uh, Carol Meyer. There's another one, too. There's another one. <laughs> Two? Okay. Yeah. I knew that the other one was. My name is Carol Meyer, and I'm the current Mojave County Recorder. And I have a letter that I have for each of you. And I would also like, um, um, I have a letter for supervisors. And also, uh, Chairman Watson, I would like you to read the letter uh, for record. May I approach? Certainly, please approach. Thank you, Mark. Ms. Meyer, did you indicate that you wanted me to read this letter? Is that correct for the record? Okay. Thank you. Uh, May 5th, 2013, to the board members. I would like to express my gratitude and appreciation for what I and my staff consider an outstanding Mojave County employee, Mr. Gene Heltner. Whether he carries the title of director or manager for the Office of Management and Budget, he is an asset to Mojave County. During our working relationship with Gene, my office has been involved with a few county projects and I would like to detail these. When I first met Gene, we started uh, a records project for the Republic Defender's Office. This project was necessary to digitize thousands of paper case filings, burdening the office of space and to create efficiencies for future retrieval and destruction. He and his staff were an integral part of the team and were there through every part of the process. We inventoried records, prepped files for digitizing, sorted and boxed transition to a vendor, and destroyed records that were beyond the retention schedule. He was there for hands-on processing, support, and from a management perspective to aid in facilitation. We believe his knowledge and experience and involvement assist in this corporation in streamlining these goals for this project. Our next venture was his brainchild, turning an unused facility into a warehouse. When he approached us, we initially thought he was reaching out far beyond our capabilities. He and his staff, again, were supportive beyond their duties and responsibilities. He had a vision to see what the potential was in reusing a structure that would have been blighted by the downtown community on Mojave County's image. Without his guidance, mentoring, and instruction, this facility will not be housing thousands of records, creating an effective, highly utilized space for the elections office and allowed essential storage space for the emergency response team. These items were previously housed inadequately, unsecured, and costing Mojave County over $16,000 for inadequate, 
inadequate external storage facilities. Gene and his staff have been instrumental in analyzing and creating new fees and guiding us on how to build a fee structure for the recorder's office services. With this, we have been able to responsibly create fees, approve them through the proper channels, effectively build our revenue for commercial services. Ultimately, we now have effective control of these services and are statutorily competent of the design. This general generated revenue has aided us in recouping costs outlaid for software and support to run these services. We've not been able to accomplish this on our own. We do not have the expertise required to do such analysis. Gene and his staff have righted several errors within our accounting practices by auditing, creating policies, and directing and guiding staff on appropriate accounting practices. My office does not have an accountant on staff and their assistance streamlined from days to a few hours. Recent events have shown that we must express our gratitude for Gene's assistance with these significant milestones for the recorder and records management office. We know that having him as contributing member of our organization enriches what we strive to accomplish. To provide a service to the public, a public servant is a connection where and how monies are spent. Gene has recently been honored by the Arizona Association of Counties, by the National Association of Counties for his commitment to Mojave County's strategic goal for energy use. Due to his efforts, Mojave County has earned the EPA's prestigious Energy Star Awards on 12 of our buildings, which is the first for any rural community. I just wanted to take this opportunity to express to Gene my th sincere thanks for not only myself, but my entire staff, we wouldn't be where we are, wouldn't be able to accomplish our future goals without him. Carol Meyer, Mojave County Reporter, for the record. Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Ma. Um, thank you. Um, was there anyone else had to speak or am I butting in line? I just want to make sure. Um, when it comes to uh, this item, uh, I believe it was continued because there was a question as to whether um, um, Mr. Hepler was going to receive or whether his job duties would significantly change and therefore he would receive some other form of compensation. It's my understanding that the, and I knew this then and I know it now, uh, but that the only thing that changed in his job duties is that who he reported to was no longer Mr. Hendricks, it's now the board, um, and that he was being changed from a classified to unclassified staff. As a result of that, I don't see any reason um, to change Mr. Hepler's current class or um, current range and step grade, which I believe is range 25 and between step five and six. Um, and uh, I would make a motion that we changed the classification of the Office of Management and Budget Manager position from classified to unclassified, which is an at-will employee at range 25 between step five and six. A second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, and also we have Mr. Gene Helpler to speak to this item today. Uh, before he says uh, too much, I would like to make a couple comments and it's my understanding, I could be wrong, but it's my understanding we're taking a classified employee mm -hmm. and then moving him to an unclassified position. I'm under the impression that in order to do that, we need to follow a guideline or at least a past experience. We're taking something away from this employee my understanding, and Mr. Ekstrom could correct it for me because I know he's got a much better idea than I do, is that Mr. He he um, Hepler's job is still protected for at least a year um, under the statute when you change some, someone from classified to unclassified, so he's still protected. Or Am I wrong about that? Uh, Mr. Moss is correct, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I, I wasn't aware it was for only one year. So. So, okay. but, and so, but there's no legal prohibition. I mean, we're allowed to do this, aren't we? You are. Yes. Yeah. Without without any sort of compensation? Under the, you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Angus, un under the merit system, 
statutes. It contemplates that people may move from classified to unclassified. It builds in a protection uh, so that they can't simply be moved and then terminated. I have a question going along with yours. I guess, I guess you, maybe you've confused me more now, Bill. I thought the federal employment laws uh, guaranteed a person if, if you hire them on a, in a job and then you change them later, it's just like they did with the state retirement system. <coughs> they offered people a bonus if they would go over to this new state retirement system to take them off the old system They because they're giving up something, uh, whether it's Mr. Heppler or, or anybody else. They have... Rules and regulations protecting them as a classified employee, as an unclassified, they have nothing, so they're giving up something. Uh, I thought under federal law that you cannot move somebody if you've hired them under that system. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Johnson, I just reviewed this with an eye towards the merit system and frankly didn't conduct a lot of research on federal law. It sounds like, you know, at first blush, it sounds as though there should be some property right protection, some due process or something like that, but. I didn't find that in our merit rules. Right, our merit rules. And, right. Or in the, county, in the state laws dealing with merit systems where you'd think that would be addressed. Did we, did we have a review by, did DHR give us any input or not into it? Did, did they look at it? Or? <coughs> I believe Mr. Osun is uh, familiar with it. Mr. Henderson, mm. answer your question, I believe. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Johnson, uh, HR did take a look at that and uh, they've made some recommendations based on uh, the reporting change and the classification change. If I could follow up with that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Supervisor Moss. Yeah. Yeah. It was also my understanding from prior HR sta um, statements that we were entitled, if we desired to, to move him from classified to unclassified and we did not need to offer him additional compensation for doing that. I mean, HR has recommended, I believe, a change of title and a pay increase, um, but it's, we're not re obligated to do that. Um, Am I wrong about that? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Moss, I, if I recall correctly, I, I recall like you did, uh, HR was recommending we do a job audit, uh, but uh, they also stated that the board did have the authority to um, change, the, change the classification of, a, of an employee without I that job audit. <coughs> I have a comment. Supervisor okay. Weatherton. I think there was some misunderstanding um, w w between us and HR maybe at that time. Uh, they did an audit, of a job audit, but we were not looking to change any kind of responsibilities or any kind of duties or we, are, we, are, we were not looking to make anyone a director or a department head. The only thing that we had asked to do is to change that position from classified to unclassified or at will. It was my belief and the belief of some others that that probably should have never been made a classified position from the very beginning because of the reporting, et cetera. Thank you, Supervisor. Brother <coughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, I guess the only thing I have, if we're, and, and Mr. Helpler wants to talk or not, but the changing of classifications, I don't know how this is going to make the county any better. Um, I, I have no problem with, with classified and unclassified people. I think the message that we're, that we're sending when we're changing a job description for no other reason than just cha or changing the job, yeah, the classification, we're in the process of trying to hire people to replace people that we've lost already, and people need to know that they have some kind of stability with us as far as when they're hired, and, and that we're not just going to change things later. I guess that's the only problem I have with it. I share your concern. Uh, Mr. Hepner. I'm Gene Hepler, the manager of Office of Management and Budget. And under uh, Arizona Statute 11352C, I have a choice of either accepting or not accepting the unclassified or classified. Uh, and I, it leaves that choice up to me. Uh, one of the things I think was very clear when they made a motion to uh, have HR look at 
uh, my job classification class, and, and you know why uh, I think that they came up with a, a fairly good job description. I looked at it. I think I should have, you know, it's not saying that I have to get a 5% or 10% raise, but if you look at administrative 11, administrative procedure 11 uh, 1 ICA, it says once you, uh, if you're going to make and move me from uh, unclassified and make me a uh, director or in charge of a department, that I have the right to, to have a discussion about my pay. Uh, also, 2B1 two, two and also 3LC uh, has that opportunity to look at, at what you're doing. So, you know, I, I just want to do a job, and my staff wants to do a job. I think there's some misunderstanding of what we do and how we do it. I appreciate uh, the recorder uh, making their comments in public. Uh, I don't have any re problem accepting it, but I think you asked HR to do their study and, and to look at that seriously. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have any questions, Mr. Hubble? Yes, I would like to make a comment. I mean, I, I certainly have not uh, said anything about your staff uh, not doing their job. If anybody probably deserves a raise, maybe they do. Uh, I, uh, I do have a problem with uh, giving an increase when there's no, absolutely no change in duties, no change in, in uh, any responsibilities. You yourself, in a conversation with me and Supervisor Hildy in my office, said you were not a director, you were not a department head, that you were just a manager. So I, I, I couldn't, I can't help but wonder why the position was classified to begin with. I, I, I have a problem with that and I think that this has happened in some other areas and I think that probably some of those things need to be corrected. Not just yours, but maybe many others. So this, this is, there is no reason, I don't see any reason for any increase in your compensation. That's just, I'm sure that everybody would like to have an increase. But if you're not gonna change your duties, your responsibilities, then, then what's the reason? So I make a motion to approve changing the classification of the Office of Management and Budget Manager's position from classified to unclassified. I think I already did. Oh, you did? <laughs> All right, then I second that. Then <laughs> <laughs> we did. Yeah, it's been a long day. <laughs> Clarification, Mr. Chairman? Supervisor Johnson. Uh, Mr. Moss, I believe your recommendation was the, the changing of it without, with no pay differentiation, right? I, I didn't hear that last part. With no pay differentiation, you said it'd be. I, I gave the classified to unclassified. Right, and I gave the range twenty-five and between step five and six, which is my understanding of his current pay. Right, I just didn't know. I had to right. make sure it's been. A if while. I'm, am I correct about that, Mr. Hippler? Is that your current pay status? <clears throat> I, I think he's indicating yes. So, I got that part at least right. I'd like to make one comment. That's probably all it is. Just a comment. Generally, in business, of which I was in private industry for over 40 years, when you take something away from someone, especially who's in management and doing a good job, it's compensated by either some, some time or some money or, or something. And maybe I am missing the boat. So we're taking a classified employee and making them an unclassified employee. Uh, tell me, are we not taking something from him? He's doing the exact same job. What are we taking from him? Suppose a job security? Is that what we're taking yes. from him? Is that incorrect? Uh, I'm going to say I Is wish I... incorrect? Um, yes and no. Okay. Um, we, because we took him, but we have him now reporting to us. So we actually changed the reporting structure. So, um, you know, I... I 
if, if it's not a law that we have to follow about it, I just don't see how we could justify to anybody working out there that we're taking someone, just having him report differently, making him unclassified, and saying he can make more money. I, I think that would be a very difficult thing to justify. Um, and I, no, I'm if the law saying. doesn't, I, I understand what you're saying, Supervisor. I, I understand what you're saying, but um, the law, apparently, right, we've been told the law covers it, and if the law covers it, so you're really just talking morally, you're not talking legally. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well then. Thank you, Supervisor. <laughs> Call for the question. Second. <laughs> Got a second? Okay. okay. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. No. Item number, where are we at here, folks? Two, 102. The 102 or 103? Two. 102. Discussion, possible action. Uh, application review, candidate interview, and hiring process for the county administrator. Uh, Sup Supervisor Moss, it's on. Move to discuss. Motion for discussion. Second. We have a motion and a second for discussion. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, I ask this for this to be put on the agenda, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, primarily uh, because of the uh, the process seemed like it was being created as we were going along and it's not that I disapprove of the process in fact I think there's a lot of good with it in the process uh, but it became early early last month mid list last month mid April it came to my attention that the panel system that we selected wasn't approved actually by the Board of Supervisors I will give a mea culpa out there um, because I think at one point someone asked me um, what my thoughts were, and I gave them, and 95% of my thoughts are there, so I'm fine with what's going on. But I thought we, to be correct um, when it comes to the process that we're following, it really needed to be approved by the Board of Supervisors, not with a, I guess, counting the noses of the various supervisors out there and making sure that a majority I'm assuming something like that happened, I'm not sure, but approve that process because okay. the board speaks, should be speaking as a whole. The second um, tier to this was, um, that, that got my, um, my, my feathers in a ruffle, was that Toby Cotter, who's the city manager for Bullhead City, dropped out. Um, it was never replaced. And so we went from a five member board, which was I think a broad cross section of the community. You know, you had the three major cities um, you had the sheriff and you had the um, presiding judicial officer um, all on the panel. But when Mr. Carter left, um, uh, the, I guess the Bullhead City contingent weren't, wasn't really being um, represented. Um, so uh, when it came to that, and I don't particularly mind personally, again, I, I don't, but I just saw a potential problem that was supposed to be a balanced panel process, which was a very business-like and professional way of doing it uh -huh. had fallen apart um, and had never been corrected. It never been brought back to us to add someone from one of the three major metropolitan areas um, to serve on that panel. The final um, thing um, that came to my attention or at least I, I got alerted to is who do we interview at the end of the day? And I believe the proposal is that the panel um, will select either one to six people um, that will interview, because I think they're interviewing up to six is my understanding, um, which is fine. I mean, I'm good with whatever their recommendations are, but I thought each board member uh, should have the right to say, I think the panel made a mistake or there's an applicant here that I think we need to look at and that that person should also be pulled into the interview process, which is why I asked for the, C the a CD with all the applications. So I'm not... Uh, um, uh, let me put it to you this way. I'm a cynic and I'm a pessimist. Hildy knows this about me. Um, I try to hide it and I try to ignore it, but it's true. If I wanted a particular result and I was serving on a panel and had the votes, I'd give you one really good guy and five lousy guys because <laughs> that way I know I'm going to get that or at least I've improved my odds for that one good guy. And as a, as a safety mechanism, um, I wanted to have, or I think the board 
um, each individual board member should have a right to say um, when we start setting interviews, which I assume would be in the month of June sometime as a, at a guess, that we um, have the right to say, yeah, I like the two, three, four, five, six the panelists sent us, but I also think that Joe Smith, who was overlooked by the panel, deserves a right to come talk to us too. So that's why I put it on the agenda to bring my concerns and observations to the board as a whole so the board as a whole can decide exactly how we're going to handle this. Um, and I like the panel process. I think it's great. I think they're doing interviews tomorrow um, or the day after or something like that. I have no problem with it, but I really think the board should be saying this is what we want to do and how we want to do it. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, I think it was HR who um, did this, but um, I think they did a good job doing it. I think they just should have dropped it on our laps and said, please rubber stamp this for us. Uh, may I take the time to answer some of your Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, uh, I believe that uh, Mr. John McCormick was going to be replacing Mr. Cotter on the, on the team. And, and that's wonderful and it's great. Um, I'm, 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 I, I know many of the people sitting on the panel. Um, and I think to the most part, in fact all of them, um, are very competent, professional, reliable citizens who are a credit to our community and would do a great job. I just thought the board should say, yes, this is the panel that is going to interview people and bring us however many names they bring us. But it's a safety mechanism because Mr. Johnson or Hildy or myself or Joy or you might say, you know, these final six, I looked at all the applications, I think you really blew the boat on them, that the board should say we're going to add this to the board's interview list if we want to. And I have no plans for doing that. I just like to have... But you'd like to have that opportunity. I like to have a plan B just in case a mistake is being made. <laughs> Certainly understand. Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Johnson. Uh, Supervisor Moss, but some of the same things that I brought up in the past, uh, I believe that the panel should give us a recommendation of whatever their top five, six, whatever numbers they think are qualified. I, I think it sh should be for us to look at available candidates to make our own minds up to say if we, we see something. Um, and I think once they make that recommendation, even if they give six or three, uh, still up to this board and we can all vote on, you know, by majority vote, how many people we want to see or not want to see because there's no sense in, you know, us bringing in people that, you know, only one of us likes, I mean, <laughs> you know, to begin with, I mean, you might, you might sway people at the, at the interview, and especially because it's cost, costly to us too, but I, I agree with what you're saying that I think it's good for us to review everything just so we, because it is our ultimate vote that, that picks the person and we want to have the best candidate, so no, I agree with what you said. So what, what my concept is, and, and thank you, Supervisor Johnson, is that, um, and I'm just throwing this out as a concept, that the board ratify, essentially, um, the persons designated by HR. Um, so our panel, in my view at least, now is legitimate. Um, they do their interviews. They make their recommendations. Um, we'll review those recommendations, I believe, probably at the May 20th meeting. And at the May 20th meeting, if Supervisor Johnson or myself or anyone else thinks we should add to whatever their recommendations are, we can discuss that then. And the board can say, let's add Joe Smith from Alabama <laughs> to our interview committee, and we can decide whether or not we want to do that. I see. So you want to go ahead and wait until May 20th then? Well, no. I'll make a motion that will be more precise on this, but I think at the May 20th meeting, by then the panel will have given us their recommendations. Correct. At the May 20th meeting, I think the board should either accept those recommendations for us to interview or reject them or modify them or add to them, um, depending on what we want to do at the May 20th meeting. Okay. Does that, did, did I, am I being clear here? Hildy's looking consternated, so. <laughs> you have a question? No, not at all. Huh. I had hoped we could move it up a little quicker, but... Uh, I, I have no problem with a special meeting to review the applicants. I just gave our... We have two weeks we meet with these Well, I, I understand it. Uh, the selection committee is meeting on the 7th. Which is tomorrow. Which is tomorrow. Uh, it is inclusive of Mr. McCormick from Bullhead City, so those people have been... Right. That person and, has been replaced. And my understanding is that Charlie Cassens has also replaced himself on that meeting because of, he's in a budget process right now. Okay. Uh, I had hoped that we could at least have a meeting to work just on the selection of the county administrator and not have any other items on it. I want to. I think that's a wonderful a meeting idea. Meeting just for the selection of the county administrator. Right. And I see a week from today is open, and we would have the uh, advantage of having the selection committee 
meeting tomorrow, we'd have that information. Th that's an excellent idea. And I uh, presume this meeting would be us to go through the, the, um, the committee's recommendations and decide whether we want to interview any of the people they recommended to us directly. That would really make sense to me. Okay. Uh, and I'll make it in the form of a motion. Uh, okay. Um, and the, or maybe you've got a better idea. You want to? Well, make no, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I like. I make a motion that we ratify the human resources um, uh, selections for the committee and the committee process. Um, that upon the completion of the committee's interview and their ranking and recommendations to the board of supervisors, that we meet from a week today to evaluate their recommendations, and that the board of supervisors as a whole will decide on which, if any, of the candidates recommended, or even not recommended. Um, by the committee would be interviewed by this board. And I'll second the motion. Okay, for discussion. Uh, we can up, set this up, obviously, for an um, executive session, because this will be closed session for the, for the employees, so just for mm -hmm. people to get the idea, we're not going to have it an open session right. for that. Right. So, right. Uh, maybe add we add should, that to our motion. I'll amend my motion to add a, an executive compo I mean, executive just, session component. It, it, they should know, I mean, but right. just in case they don't understand. Right. Um, I'll send it over. So that means that as soon as the panel is done tomorrow and they get their recommendations, they probably should, I don't know, maybe you could ask Mr. Osuna if they, if they want to immediately call these people to make sure they're still interested so they don't give us six people and one of them doesn't want to come or three don't want to come or something uh, so we know exactly who the, you know, narrows down our, our, our point of view that would. I work out real good, and I don't think Havasu has somebody on the board now, just to clarify that part, because... Brian Springberg, I believe, was a name right, that I, was... I think it was. We, we picked the three managers. It wasn't right. like an open thing for the three managers, if they couldn't make it, to decide on who their, <laughs> who their, best, well, maybe, who their best option was. Maybe I think, we so. uh, should discuss that, because for a five-person board, we really need to have a replacement. And I thought it would be a good idea to have the city managers, if they can't make it, to send a designee. Uh, in their place. Right. So, See, I didn't think that a, a, a manager wasn't his choice. Either he could make it or he wouldn't make it. So I, I don't know how that works. But especially it's tomorrow anyway, so now they're well, trying to get people. And right. And for the record, um, my understanding is Charlie Castens from Lake Havasu can't make it because they're in budget meetings tomorrow. Yeah. And they're trying to, I know that Mr. Hendricks is trying to accelerate this process as much as he can. And um, Toby Carter couldn't do it because there's a conflict with one of the top six and he didn't want to be in a, creating an appearance of an issue. Um, he's, he, more practically speaking, he was in a lose-lose. If, his, if his, one of his bosses got the nod, it, he had an inside job and his reputation is besmirched. If his boss didn't get the job, his boss might be looking at his continued longevity for employment. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Toby was very wise to back out and appoint a designee, in my opinion. <laughs> All right. Okay, we have a motion and a second, I believe. And I'll check with the clerk. Clerk, do we have uh, clarity? Okay. There being no further discussion, those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carried. Item number 103, discussion, possible action. Uh, approve the county administrator's job description dated February 5th, 2013. Motion for discussion. So moved. I'll second the motion. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Uh, discussion. I guess I'll get the ball rolling um, on this. Um, at, back in February, um, we approved um, a change from a county administrative system to a county manager system. Um, and uh, which was good and I thought based upon the meeting that the exact job duties of what the county administrator was going to be would come back to the board for future discussion. Um, I later found out um, that what happened and I think it was through no particular fault of anybody it's just these one of these ministerial tasks that need to be done is that Mr. Hendricks had to sign something um, because he'd been appointed county administrator um, and in order to ensure that he had something to sign um, it looks like Mr. Asuna um, swapped the, the county manager job duties with the county administrative job duties, just switching out the names. And as a temporary stopgap, I don't think I have any heartburn over that because, you know, 
Mr. Hendricks did have to sign something. Um, but when it comes to exactly what we envision a county administrator doing as opposed to a county manager, I think it's something we need to discuss and decide upon as opposed to just swapping titles, um, which I think is good for showing a direction that we want to go as a county, but really isn't very high in the way of substance. So um, uh, that's what I would throw out there is I think we really need to do, do have a discussion on this and perhaps a, an in-depth discussion that would be a more appropriate in a workshop type of setting where we go through and line by line and what can we negotiate with and what does Yavapai do and what does Yuma do and elsewhere. But may, may I? But here's the Supervisor problem. Supervisor Angus. This is the job description that went out with the, for the job interviewers. So oh, that's a problem, you're right. That's a huge problem. That's a huge problem. On the other hand, um, it's my view, and this is just my view, we really should have had this discussion back in March. We should. Okay. Um, but we're, we're young and wet behind the ears, <laughs> a lot of us, when it comes to being supervisors, and we didn't spot the error until April, which means it didn't get put onto the May mm -hmm. agenda. I'll put not to say error, I'll say the oversight. And so it didn't get put onto the May agenda. So better late than never is view number one. View number two is these people know they're being employed for a county administrator position, and they know that their job duties are subject to the pleasure of the board. I think it says so at the very end. Such other duties or whatnot at the pleasure of the board. And then we add or delete to those duties, that's part of the job. You're a professional. Deal with it. It's kind of like the Marine Corps going in and hitting beach number A, and then your commanding officer says, oh, by the way, we need to go 500 yards out that way and take the hill. You didn't intend to do that when you woke up in the morning, <laughs> but, you can, but your boss just told you, and now you got to do it. Mr. Chairman, I don't know what um, Supervisor Moss would like us to do today, but I think when Supervisor Angus said and Supervisor Moss agreed, it's already gone out, the job description. Um, which still doesn't mean much. It's kind of a general because we will have to negotiate a contract with whoever comes anyway. So <laughs> basically the name will stay the same and everything else will probably change. So I'm not sure what direction you want to go in. But. Uh, I, I really do think we need to schedule something in the very near future before we offer a contract so we determine what we want our county administrator to do. And then we represent those job duties to that county administrator he or she can determine whether it's something that they want to do within the universe of their professional expertise or not. But until we do that first part of the equation, what we want, um, how can they know whether they're willing to accept it or not? And when it comes could to- Could we do that next Monday? Would that be a good time? Um, I suppose we could, that's Gary. I think uh, we're a little bit behind the, the cart behind the horse, but what I might offer is we do it in a workshop that's what I thought would be a good idea. Basically, invite the public, go all sorts of give and take, and because this is their county administrator too, this is their chief CEO. Right, and after we meet on the seventh, we'll have a pretty good idea of who mm -hmm. the finalist may be. Right, and it might be after that time, because it may be insightful to know who those finalists are. Sure. In order to make sure that you're cited up correctly on what your mm -hmm. thought process might be for your expectations. Right. So. Uh, possibly uh, entertaining a workshop after the, uh, what would be the week from today. So after we select who we're gonna interview, then we can do the workshop and decide what duties we're gonna send along with that. I would think, yeah. how does that Yeah, does that makes sense to me. I'm not sure how to put that in a motion. I, I'll, I'll make an effort. <laughs> I mean, I'm just always... schedule, schedule a workshop for uh, determining uh, county administrator duties. Yeah, okay. And I'll get a second. How's that? I'll uh, second it. We have a, a motion and a second mm -hmm. to schedule a county workshop to outline the responsibilities of our county administrator. Second. And uh, just for clarification, this will be uh, made available by phone, you guys. Are Double the meetings today, plus I already got two more special meetings. <laughs> but we don't have a date. So. <laughs> Can you clarify when this is going to take place, please, in your motion? When is it going to take place, please? Uh, we'll get a decision on, on our meeting a week from today. And we, we'll put a time together. Sure. Okay. And, I, and I guess on that, too, uh, I mean, Supervisor Mosh brought it up, but I, I a little disagree with the fact that 
this is somebody that's working for the Board of Supervisors. This is not working for the public. I mean, it's well and good to have public input, but when we're hiring somebody, I don't, I mean, you guys will be sitting here for the meeting. You can have all the public input well, you want, but they, they work for this board, not for the citizens. Well, I'll, I'll put it in, in business terms that I'm used to dealing with. We're the board of directors for the county. Um, the county administrator is our CEO. He runs the day-to-day -day operations for us. The citizens are our shareholders. And so we, so, so in an attenuated type of way, in a business type of way, he does work for them even though he reports to us. So that's, that's my philosophy when it comes to trying to equate public versus private functions. I, I guess, but when they, I'm just saying that we were elected to make some of these decisions, not to have public input on everything. It's, it's just my opinion. Chairman Watson. Right. We have item number. Uh, Excuse me, Chairman Watson. Is this meeting going to take place after the first meeting on the 13th? We only we don't have a meeting on the 13th, this next do we? We have a special meeting now. A on the special 13th. meeting to review the applicants. Monday. A week from today. A week from today. For. To review to review the applications and the recommendations of the committee. Right. right. And then, at that meeting on the 13th to make a recommendation for the work. So the workshop will not take place on that day, or it will? Well, we, we can have a workshop that afternoon or we can set, set one that day. It's up to, it's, I don't have a preference. I, I've got no preference. Um, can, I, can I amend the motion? Um, can amend? Is that, uh, that we have a um, review at the committee's applicants and recommendations um, for you know, acceptance, modification, deletion, or addition on um, uh, May 13th, which is a week from today, and then following that, um, conduct a workshop for the Board of Supervisors to determine with public input um, what they believe the job duties of the county administrator should be. Very good. Second the motion. And then we have one more item on the agenda. Do we want to? Vote on the of which uh, Ms. French would like to. Uh, Gary, we I think we need to vote on the. Um, I'm sorry. We need to vote on the motion. Okay. 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 Any further discussion? <laughs> <laughs> Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Motion carried. Now I can get to number 104. <laughs> and that's uh, the discussion and possible action, uh, approving the risk manager's director's job classification. And uh, Ms. Peggy Prince would like to recuse herself from this discussion, so. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah executive session. Be an executive she session. got a vote? She got to recuse herself. Now, it's an executive executive is this an executive session item? We, yes. There could be an executive session item, so I'll need a motion to go in executive session. I move. It's up to Mr. He, Prince, isn't it? He did, he asked. He, he wanted mm -hmm. it in executive okay. session. Yeah. yeah. I move that we go into executive session. And need a second? Second. All right. Hey, we're getting towards the end. <laughs>
reconvene the meeting. Uh, at this point, I believe we can report that uh, we've approved. Well, you haven't done no, no, no. no. Wow. no. Um, make, a motion. make a motion for the make a motion for the approval. If, if I can clarify, Mr. Chairman, certainly. If we've already approved Mr. Prince as an unclassified employee as a risk manager at a certain pay scale. So if we wanted to keep that in place, will we just let item 104 die? That's where I was Those are your choices, uh, okay, Mr. Moss. You can either make a motion or you can just let it be. And I go for a death. Mm -hmm. well, it's clear. Make a motion for death. Lack of a, <laughs> Seconded. Lack of a second. <laughs> OK, here we go. <laughs> Meeting adjourned. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to go. Oh, I, uh, I wasn't, uh,